Benito Sereno by Herman Melville. In the year 1799, Captain Amasa Delano of Duxbury in Massachusetts, commanding a large sealer and general trader, lay at anchor with a valuable cargo in the harbor of St. Maria, a small desert uninhabited island towards the southern extremity of the long coast of Chile. There he had touched for water. On the second day, not long after dawn, while lying in his berth, his mate came below, informing him that a strange sail was coming into the bay. Ships were then not so plenty in those waters as now. He rose, dressed, and went on deck. The morning was one peculiar to that coast. Everything was mute and calm, everything gray. The sea, though undulated into long roods of swells, seemed fixed, and was sleeked at the surface like waved lead that has cooled and set in the smelter's mould. The sky seemed a gray mantle. Flights of troubled gray fowl, kith and kin, with flights of troubled gray vapors among which they were mixed, skimmed low and fitfully over the waters, as swallows over meadows before storms. Shadows present, foreshadowing deeper shadows to come. To Captain Delano's surprise, the stranger viewed through the glass showed no colors, though to do so upon entering a haven, however uninhabited in its shores, where but a single other ship might be lying, was the custom among peaceful seamen of all nations. Considering the lawlessness and loneliness of the spot, and the sort of stories at that day associated with those seas, Captain Delano's surprise might have deepened into some uneasiness had he not been a person of singularly undistrustful good nature, not liable, except on extraordinary and repeated excitement, and hardly then, to indulge in personal alarms any way involving the imputation of malign evil in man, whether in view of what humanity is capable, such a trait implies, along with a benevolent heart, more than ordinary quickness and accuracy of intellectual perception may be left to the wise to determine. But whatever misgivings might have obtruded on first seeing the stranger would almost, in any seaman's mind, have been dissipated by observing that the ship, in navigating into the harbor, was drawing too near the land for her own safety's sake, owing to a sunken reef making out off her bow. This seemed to prove her a stranger indeed, not only to the sealer, but the island. Consequently, she could be no wanted freebooter in that ocean. With no small interest, Captain Delano continued to watch her, a proceeding not much facilitated by the vapors partly mantling the hull, through which the far matin light from her cabin streamed equivocally enough. Much like the sun, by this time crescented on the rim of the horizon, and apparently, in company with the strange ship, entering the harbor, which, wimpled by the same low creeping clouds, showed not unlike a Lima Intraguante's one sinister eye peering across the plaza from the Indian loophole of her dusk Saya y Manta. It might have been but a deception of the vapors, but the longer the stranger was watched, the more singular appeared her maneuvers. Ere long it seemed hard to decide whether she meant to come in or no, what she wanted or what she was about. The wind, which had breezed up a little during the night, was now extremely light and baffling, which the more increased the apparent uncertainty of her movements. Surmising at last that it might be a ship in distress, Captain Delano ordered his whaleboat to be dropped, and, much to the wary opposition of his mate, prepared to board her and, at the least, pilot her in. On the night previous, a fishing party of the seamen had gone a long distance to some detached rocks out of sight from the sealer, and an hour or two before daybreak had returned, having met with no small success. Presuming that the stranger might have been long off soundings, the good captain put several baskets of the fish for presents into his boat, and so pulled away. From her continuing too near the sunken reef, deeming her in danger, calling to his men, 
he made all haste to apprise those on board of their situation. But some time ere the boat came up, the wind, light though it was, having shifted, had headed the vessel off, as well as partly broken the vapors from about her. Upon gaining a less remote view, the ship, when made signally visible on the verge of the leaden-hued swells, with the shreds of fog here and there raggedly furring her, appeared like a whitewashed monastery after a thunderstorm, seen perched upon some dun cliff among the Pyrenees. But it was no purely fanciful resemblance, which now, for a moment, almost led Captain Delano to think that nothing less than a shipload of monks was before him. Peering over the bulwarks were, what really seemed, in the hazy distance, throngs of dark cows, while, fitfully revealed through the open portholes, other dark-moving figures were dimly descried, as of black friars pacing the cloisters. Upon a still nigher approach, this appearance was modified, and the true character of the vessel was plain. A Spanish merchantman of the first class carrying negro slaves, amongst other valuable freight, from one colonial port to another. A very large, and in its time, a very fine vessel, such as in those days were at intervals encountered along that main, sometimes superseded Acapulco treasure ships, or retired frigates of the Spanish king's navy, which, like superannuated Italian palaces, still, under a decline of masters, preserved signs of former state. As the whale-boat drew more and more nigh, the cause of the peculiar pipe-clayed aspect of the stranger was seen in the slovenly neglect pervading her. The spars, ropes, and great part of the bulwarks looked woolly, from long unacquaintance with the scraper, tar, and the brush. Her keels seemed laid, her ribs put together, and she launched from Ezekiel's valley of dry bones. In the present business in which she was engaged, the ship's general model and rig appeared to have undergone no material change from their original warlike and Froissart pattern. However, no guns were seen. The tops were large, and were railed about with what had once been octagonal network, all in sad disrepair. The tops hung overhead like three ruinous aviaries, in one of which was seen perched, on a ratlin, a white noddy, a strange fowl, so called from its lethargic somnambulistic character, being frequently caught by hand at sea. Battered and moldy, the castellated forecastle seemed some ancient turret long ago taken by assault and then left to decay. Towards the stern, two high-raised quarter-galleys, the balustrades here and there covered with dry, tindery sea-moss, opening out from the unoccupied state cabin, whose dead lights, for all the mild weather, were hermetically closed and caulked. These tenantless balconies hung over the sea as if it were the Grand Venetian Canal. But the principal relic of faded grandeur was the ample oval of the shield-like sternpiece, intricately carved with the arms of Castile and Leon, medallioned about by groups of mythological or symbolical devices, uppermost and central of which was a dark satyr in a mask, holding his foot on the prostrate neck of a writhing figure, likewise masked. Whether the ship had a figurehead or only a plain beak was not quite certain, owing to canvas wrapped about that part, either to protect it while undergoing a refurbishing, or else decently to hide its decay. Rudely painted or chalked, as in a sailor freak, along the forward side of a sort of pedestal below the canvas, was the sentence, Seguid vestro jefe, follow your leader while upon the tarnished headboards nearby appeared in stately capitals, once gilt, the ship's name, San Dominic, each letter streakingly corroded with tricklings of copper spike rust, while, like morning weeds, dark festoons of seagrass slimily swept to and fro over the name with every hearse-like roll of the hull. As at last the boat was hooked from the bow, along toward the gangway amidship, its keel, while yet some inches separated from the hull, harshly grated as on a sunken coral reef, 
It proved a huge bunch of conglobated barnacles adhering below the water to the side like a wen, a token of baffling airs and long calms passed somewhere in those seas. End of Section 1 Section 2 of Benito Sereno Climbing the side, the visitor was at once surrounded by a clamorous throng of whites and blacks, but the latter outnumbering the former more than could have been expected, negro transportation ship as the stranger in port was. But in one language, and as with one voice, all poured out a common tale of suffering, in which the negresses, of whom there were not a few, exceeded the others in their dolorous vehemence. The scurvy, together with the fever, had swept off a great part of their number, more especially the Spaniards. Off Cape Horn they had narrowly escaped shipwreck. Then for days together they had lain tranced without wind. Their provisions were low, their water next to none, their lips that moment were baked. While Captain Delano was thus made the mark of all eager tongues, his one eager glance took in all the faces with every other object about him. Always upon first boarding a large and populous ship at sea, especially a foreign one, with a nondescript crew such as Lasker's or Manila men, the impression varies in a peculiar way from that produced by first entering a strange house with strange inmates in a strange land. Both house and ship, the one by its walls and blinds, the other by its high bulwarks like ramparts, hoard from view their interiors till the last moment. But in the case of the ship there is this addition, that the living spectacle it contains upon its sudden and complete disclosure has, in contrast with the blank ocean which zones it, something of the effect of enchantment. The ship seems unreal. These strange costumes, gestures, and faces, but a shadowy tableau, just emerged from the deep, which directly must receive back what it gave. Perhaps it was some such influence as above is attempted to be described, which, in Captain Delano's mind, heightened whatever, upon a staid scrutiny, might have seemed unusual. Especially the conspicuous figures of four elderly grizzled negroes, their heads like black, dotted willow-tops, who, in venerable contrast to the tumult below them, were couched sphinx-like, one on the starboard cathead, another on the larboard, and the remaining pair face to face on the opposite bulwarks above the main chains. They each had bits of unstranded old junk in their hands, and, with a sort of stoical self-content, were picking the junk into oakum, a small heap of which lay by their sides. They accompanied the task with a continuous, low, monotonous chant, droning and drooling away like so many grey-headed bagpipers playing a funeral march. The quarter-deck rose into an ample elevated poop, upon the forward verge of which, lifted, like the oakum pickers, some eight feet above the general throng, sat along in rows, separated by regular spaces, the cross-legged figures of six other blacks, each with a rusty hatchet in his hand, which, with a bit of brick and rag, he was engaged like a scullion in scouring, while between each two was a small stack of hatchets, their rusted edges turned forward, awaiting a like operation though occasionally the four oakum pickers would briefly address some person or persons in the crowd below, yet the six hatchet polishers neither spoke to others nor breathed a whisper among themselves, but sat intent upon their task, except at intervals, when with the peculiar love in negroes of uniting industry with pastime, two and two they sideways clashed their hatchets together, like symbols with a barbarous din. All six, unlike the generality, had the raw aspect of unsophisticated Africans. But the first comprehensive glance which took in these ten figures, with scores less conspicuous, rested but an instant upon them, as, 
Impatient of the hubbub of voices, the visitor turned in quest of whomsoever it might be that commanded the ship. But, as if not unwilling to let nature make known her own case among his suffering charges, or else in despair of restraining it for the time, the Spanish captain, a gentlemanly, reserved-looking and rather young man to a stranger's eye, dressed with a singular richness, but bearing plain traces of sleepless cares and disquietudes, stood passively by, leaning against the mainmast, at one moment casting a dreary, spiritless look upon his excited people, at the next an unhappy glance toward his visitor. By his side stood a black of small stature, in whose rude face, as occasionally like a shepherd's dog, he mutely turned it up to the Spaniards. Sorrow and affection were equally blended. Struggling through the throng, the American advanced to the Spaniard, assuring him of his sympathies, and offering to render whatever assistance might be in his power, to which the Spaniard returned, for the present, but grave and ceremonious acknowledgments, his national formality dusked by the saturnine mood of ill health. But losing no time in mere compliments, Captain Delano returned to the gangway, had his baskets of fish brought up, and as the wind still continued light, so that some hours at least must elapse ere the ship could be brought to the anchorage, he bade his men return to the sealer, and fetch back as much water as the whale-boat could carry, with whatever soft bread the steward might have, all the remaining pumpkins on board, with a box of sugar, and a dozen of his private bottles of cider. Not many minutes after the boat's pushing off, to the vexation of all, the wind entirely died away, and the tide turning began drifting back the ship helplessly seaward. But trusting this would not last, Captain Delano sought with good hopes to cheer up the strangers, feeling no small satisfaction that, with persons in their condition, he could, thanks to his frequent voyages along the Spanish main, converse with some freedom in their native tongue. While left alone with them, he was not long in observing some things tending to heighten his first impressions, but surprise was lost in pity, both for the Spaniards and blacks, alike evidently reduced from scarcity of water and provisions, while long-continued suffering seemed to have brought out the less good-natured quality of the negroes, besides, at the same time, impairing the Spaniards' authority over them. But, under the circumstances, precisely this condition of things was to have been anticipated. In armies, navies, cities, or families, in nature herself nothing more relaxes good order than misery. Still, Captain Delano was not without the idea that had Benito Sereno been a man of greater energy, Miss Rule could hardly have come to the present pass. But the debility, constitutional or induced by the hardships, bodily and mental, of the Spanish captain was too obvious to be overlooked. A prey to settled dejection, as if long mocked with hope he would not now indulge it even when it had ceased to be a mock. The prospect of that day or evening at furthest, lying at anchor with plenty of water for his people, and a brother captain to counsel and befriend, seemed in no perceptible degree to encourage him. His mind appeared unstrung, if not more seriously affected. Shut up in the oaken walls, chained to one dull round of command, whose unconditionality cloyed him, like some hypochondriac abbot he moved slowly about, at times suddenly pausing, starting or staring, biting his lip, biting his fingernail, flushing, paling, twitching his beard, with other symptoms of an absent or moody mind. This distempered spirit was lodged, as before hinted, in as distempered a frame. He was rather tall, but seemed never to have been robust, and now with nervous suffering was worn almost to a skeleton. A tendency to some pulmonary complaint 
appeared to have been lately confirmed. His voice was like that of one with the lungs half gone, hoarsely suppressed, a husky whisper. No wonder that, as in this state he tottered about, his private servant apprehensively followed him. Sometimes the negro gave his master his arm, or took his handkerchief out of his pocket for him, performing these and similar offices with that affectionate zeal which transmutes into something filial or fraternal, acts in themselves but menial, and which has gained for the negro the repute of making the most pleasing body-servant in the world, one, too, whom a master need be on no stiffly superior terms with, but may treat with familiar trust, less a servant than a devoted companion. Marking the noisy indocility of the blacks in general, as well as what seemed the sullen inefficiency of the whites, it was not without humane satisfaction that Captain Delano witnessed the steady good conduct of Babo. But the good conduct of Babo, hardly more than the ill behavior of others, seemed to withdraw the half-lunatic Don Benito from his cloudy languor. Not that such precisely was the impression made by the Spaniard on the mind of his visitor. The Spaniard's individual unrest was, for the present, but noted as conspicuous a feature in the ship's general affliction. Still, Captain Delano was not a little concerned at what he could not help taking for the time to be Don Benito's unfriendly indifference towards himself. The Spaniard's manner, too, conveyed a note of sour and gloomy disdain, which he seemed at no pains to disguise. But this the American in charity ascribed to the harassing effects of sickness, since, in former instances, he had noted that there are peculiar natures on whom prolonged physical suffering seems to cancel every social instinct of kindness, as if forced to black bread themselves, they deemed it but equity that each person coming nigh them should, indirectly by some slight or affront, be made to partake of their fare. But ere long Captain Delano bethought him that, indulgent as he was at the first, in judging the Spaniard he might not, after all, have exercised charity enough. At bottom it was Don Benito's reserve which displeased him, but the same reserve was shown towards all but his personal attendant. Even the formal reports which, according to sea usage, were at stated times made to him by some petty underling, either a white, mulatto, or black, he hardly had patience enough to listen to without betraying contemptuous aversion. His manner upon such occasions was, in its degree, not unlike that which might be supposed to have been his imperial countryman's, Charles V., just previous to the anchoritish retirement of that monarch from the throne. This splenetic disrelish of his place was evinced in almost every function pertaining to it. Proud as he was moody, he condescended to no personal mandate. Whatever special orders were necessary, their delivery was delegated to his body-servant, who in turn transferred them to their alternate destination through runners, alert Spanish boys or slave boys, like pages or pilot fish within easy call, continually hovering around Don Benito, so that to have beheld this undemonstrative invalid gliding about apathetic and mute, no landsman could have dreamed that in him was lodged a dictatorship beyond which, while at sea, there was no earthly appeal. Thus the Spaniard, regarded in his reserve, seemed as the involuntary victim of mental disorder. But, in fact, his reserve might, in some degree, have proceeded from design. If so, then in Don Benito was evinced the unhealthy climax of that icy, though conscientious policy, more or less adopted by all commanders of large ships, which, except in signal emergencies, obliterates alike the manifestation of sway with every trace of sociality, transforming the man into a block, or rather into a loaded cannon, which, until there is call for thunder, has nothing to say. Viewing him in this light, it seemed but a natural token of the perverse habit 
induced by a long course of such hard self-restraint that, notwithstanding the present condition of his ship, the Spaniard should still persist in a demeanor which, however harmless, or it may be appropriate, in a well-appointed vessel, such as the San Dominic might have been at the outset of the voyage, was anything but judicious now. But the Spaniard perhaps thought that it was with captains as with gods, reserve under all events must still be their cue. But, more probably, this appearance of slumbering dominion might have been but an attempted disguise to conscious imbecility, not deep policy but shallow device. But be all as this might, whether Don Benito's manner was designed or not, the more Captain Delano noted its pervading reserve, the less he felt uneasiness at any particular manifestation of that reserve towards himself. Neither were his thoughts taken up by the captain alone, wanted to the quiet orderliness of the sealer's comfortable family of a crew, the noisy confusion of the San Dominic's suffering host repeatedly challenged his eye. Some prominent breaches not only of discipline but of decency were observed. These Captain Delano could not but ascribe, in the main, to the absence of those subordinate deck officers to whom, along with higher duties, is entrusted what may be styled the police department of a populous ship. True, the old oakum pickers appeared at times to act the part of monitorial constables to their countrymen, the blacks, but though occasionally succeeding in allaying trifling outbreaks now and then between man and man, they could do little or nothing towards establishing a general quiet. The San Dominic was in the condition of a transatlantic immigrant ship, among whose multitude of living freight are some individuals, doubtless, as little troublesome as crates and bales, but the friendly remonstrances of such with their ruder companions are of not so much avail as the unfriendly arm of the mate. What the San Dominic wanted was, what the immigrant ship has, stern superior officers, but on these decks not so much as a fourth mate was to be seen. End of Section 2 Section 3 of Benito Sereno The visitor's curiosity was roused to learn the particulars of those mishaps which had brought about such absenteeism, with its consequences because, though deriving some inkling of the voyage from the whales which at the first moment had greeted him, yet of the details no clear understanding had been had. The best account would, doubtless, be given by the captain, yet at first the visitor was loath to ask it, unwilling to provoke some distant rebuff. But plucking up courage, he at last accosted Don Benito, renewing the expression of his benevolent interest, adding that did he, Captain Delano, but know the particulars of the ship's misfortunes, he would, perhaps, be better able, in the end, to relieve them. Would Don Benito favor him with the whole story? Don Benito faltered, then, like some somnambulist suddenly interfered with, vacantly stared at his visitor, and ended by looking down on the deck. He maintained this posture so long that Captain Delano, almost equally disconcerted, and involuntarily almost as rude, turned suddenly from him, walking forward to accost one of the Spanish seamen for the desired information. But he had hardly gone five paces, when with a sort of eagerness Don Benito invited him back, regretting his momentary absence of mind, and professing readiness to gratify him. While most part of the story was being given, the two captains stood on the after part of the main deck, a privileged spot, no one being near but the servant. It is now a hundred and ninety days, began the Spaniard, in his husky whisper, that this ship, well officered and well manned, with several cabin passengers, some fifty Spaniards in all, sailed from Buenos Aires, bound to Lima, with a general cargo, Paraguay tea and the like, and, pointing forward, that parcel of negroes, 
now not more than a hundred and fifty, as you see, but then numbering over three hundred souls. Off Cape Horn we had heavy gales. In one moment, by night, three of my best officers, with fifteen sailors, were lost. With the main yard, the spars snapping under them in the slings, as they sought, with heavers, to beat down the icy sail. To lighten the hull, the heavier sacks of Mata were thrown into the sea, with most of the water pipes lashed on deck at the time, and this last necessity it was, combined with the prolonged detentions afterwards experienced, which eventually brought about our chief causes of suffering. When here there was a sudden fainting attack of his cough, brought on, no doubt, by his mental distress, his servants sustained him, and drawing a cordial from his pocket placed it to his lips. He a little revived, but unwilling to leave him unsupported, while yet imperfectly restored, the black with one arm still encircled his master, at the same time keeping his eye fixed on his face, as if to watch for the first sign of complete restoration, or relapse, as the event might prove. The Spaniard proceeded, but brokenly and obscurely, as one in a dream. Oh, my God, rather than pass through what I have, with joy I would have hailed the most terrible gales, but... His cough returned, and with increased violence. This subsiding, with reddened lips and closed eyes, he fell heavily against his supporter. His mind wanders. He was thinking of the plague that followed the gales, plaintively sighed the servant. My poor, poor master, wringing one hand and with the other wiping the mouth. But be patient, senor, again turning to Captain Delano. These fits do not last long. Master will soon be himself. Don Benito, reviving, went on. But as this portion of the story was very brokenly delivered, the substance only will here be set down. It appeared that after the ship had been many days tossed in storms off the Cape, the scurvy broke out, carrying off numbers of the whites and blacks. When at last they had worked round into the Pacific, their spars and sails were so damaged, and so inadequately handled by the surviving mariners, most of whom were become invalids, that, unable to lay her northerly course by the wind, which was powerful, the unmanageable ship for successive days and nights was blown northwestward, where the breeze suddenly deserted her in unknown waters to sultry calms. The absence of the water pipes now proved as fatal to life as before their presence had menaced it. Induced, or at least aggravated by the more than scanty allowance of water, a malignant fever followed the scurvy, with the excessive heat of the lengthened calm, making such short work of it as to sweep away, as by billows, whole families of the Africans, and yet a larger number proportionally of the Spaniards, including, by a luckless fatality, every officer on board. Consequently, in the smart west winds eventually following the calm, the already rent sails having to be simply dropped, not furled at need, had been gradually reduced to the beggar's rags they were now. To procure substitutes for his lost sailors, as well as supplies of water and sails, the captain, at the earliest opportunity, had made for Baldivia, the southernmost civilized port of Chile and South America. But upon nearing the coast, the thick weather had prevented him from so much as sighting that harbor. Since which period, almost without a crew, and almost without canvas, and almost without water, and at intervals giving its added dead to the sea, the San Dominic had been battledored about by contrary winds, inveigled by currents, or grown weedy in calms. Like a man lost in woods, more than once she had doubled upon her own track. But throughout these calamities, huskily continued Don Benito, painfully turning in the half-embrace of his servant. I have to thank those negroes you see, who, 
though to your inexperienced eyes appearing unruly, have indeed conducted themselves with less of restlessness than even their owner could have thought possible under such circumstances. Here he again fell faintly back. Again his mind wandered, but he rallied, and less obscurely proceeded. Yes, their owner was quite right in assuring me that no fetters would be needed with his blacks, so that while, as is wont in this transportation, those negroes have always remained upon deck, not thrust below, as in the guinea men, they have also, from the beginning, been freely permitted to range within given bounds at their pleasure. Once more the faintness returned, his mind roved, but recovering he resumed. But it is Babo here, to whom, under God, I owe not only my own preservation, but likewise to him chiefly, the merit is due of pacifying his more ignorant brethren, when at intervals tempted to murmurings. Ah, master, sighed the black, bowing his face, don't speak of me, Babo is nothing. What Babo has done was but duty. Faithful fellow, cried Captain Delano. Don Benito, I envy you such a friend. Slave I cannot call him. End of section three. Chapter four. The Blacks. As master and man stood before him, the black upholding the white, Captain Delano could not but bethink him of the beauty of that relationship, which could present such a spectacle of fidelity on the one hand, and confidence on the other. The scene was heightened by the contrast in dress denoting their relative positions. The Spaniard wore a loose chili jacket of dark velvet, white small clothes and stockings with silver buckles at the knee and instep, a high-crowned sombrero of fine grass, a slender sword silver-mounted hung from a knot in his sash the last being an almost invariable adjunct more for utility than ornament of a south american general's dress to this hour excepting when his occasional nervous contortions brought about disarray there was a certain precision in his attire curiously at variance with the unsightly disorder around especially in the belittered ghetto forward of the mainmast wholly occupied by the blacks the servant wore nothing but wide trousers, apparently, from their coarseness and patches, made out of some old topsail. They were clean, and confined at the waist by a bit of unstranded rope, which, with his composed, deprecatory air at times, made him look something like a begging friar of St. Francis. However unsuitable for the time and place, at least in the blunt-thinking American's eyes, and however strangely surviving in the midst of all his afflictions, the toilette of Don Benito might not, in fashion at least, have gone beyond the style of the day among South Americans of his class. Though on the present voyage sailing from Buenos Aires, he had avowed himself a native and resident of Chile, whose inhabitants had not so generally adopted the plain coat and once plebeian pantaloons. But with a becoming modification adhered to their provincial costume, picturesque as any in the world. Still, relatively to the pale history of the voyage and his own pale face, there seemed something so incongruous in the Spaniard's apparel, as almost to suggest the image of an invalid courtier tottering about London streets in the time of the plague. The portion of the narrative which, perhaps, most excited interest, as well as some surprise, considering the latitudes in question, was the long calms spoken of, and more particularly the ship so long drifting about. Without communicating the opinion, of course, the American could not but impute at least part of the detentions both to clumsy seamanship and faulty navigation. Eyeing Don Benito's small yellow hands, he easily inferred that the young captain had not got into command of the hall's hole, but the cabin window, and if so, why wonder at incompetence in youth, sickness, and aristocracy united? Such was his democratic conclusion. But drowning criticism in compassion, after a fresh repetition of his sympathies, Captain Delano, having heard out his story, not only engaged, as in the first place, to see Don Benito and his people supplied in their immediate bodily needs, but also, now further promised to assist him in procuring a large permanent supply of water, as well as some sails and rigging. And though it would involve no small embarrassment to himself, yet he would spare three of his best seamen for temporary deck officers, so that without delay the ship might proceed to Concepcion, there fully to refit for Lima, her destined port. 
Such generosity was not without its effect, even upon the invalid. His face lighted up, eager and hectic, he met the honest glance of his visitor. With gratitude he seemed overcome. "'This excitement is bad for master,' whispered the servant, taking his arm, and with soothing words gently drawing him aside. When Don Benito returned, the American was pained to observe that his hopefulness, like the sudden kindling in his cheek, was but febrile and transient. Ere long, with joyless mien, looking up toward the poop, the host invited his guest to accompany him there, for the benefit of what little breath of wind might be stirring. As during the telling of the story, Captain Delano had once or twice started at the occasional assembling of the hatchet polishers, wondering why such an interruption should be allowed, especially in that part of the ship and in the ears of an invalid. And, moreover, as the hatchets had anything but an attractive look, and the handlers of them still less so, it was therefore, to tell the truth, not without some lurking reluctance, or even shrinking, it may be, that Captain Delano, with apparent complacence, acquiesced in his host's invitation. The more so, since an untimely caprice of punctilio rendered distressing by his cadaverous aspect, Don Benito, with Castilian bows, solemnly insisted upon his guest, preceding him up the ladder leading to the elevation, where, one on each side of the last step, sat four armorial supporters and sentries, two of the ominous file. Gingerly enough stepped good Captain Delano between them, and in the instant of leaving them behind, like one running the gauntlet, he felt an apprehensive twitch in the calves of his legs. But when, facing about, he saw the whole file, like so many organ-grinders, still stupidly intent on their work, unmindful of everything beside, he could not but smile at his late fidgeting panic. Presently, while standing with Don Benito, looking forward upon the decks below, he was struck by one of those instances of insubordination previously alluded to. Three black boys, with two Spanish boys, were sitting together on the hatches, scraping a rude wooden platter in which some scanty mess had recently been cooked. Suddenly one of the black boys, enraged at a word dropped by one of his white companions, seized a knife, and though called to forbear by one of the oakum pickers, struck the lad over the head, inflicting a gash from which blood flowed. In amazement Captain Delano inquired what this meant, to which the pale Benito dully muttered that it was merely the sport of the lad. "'Pretty serious sport, truly,' rejoined Captain Delano. "'Had such a thing happened on board the Bachelor's Delight, "'instant punishment would have followed.' "'At these words the Spaniard turned upon the American "'one of his sudden, staring, half-lunatic looks. "'Then, relapsing into his torpor, answered, "'Doubtless, doubtless, Signor.' "'Is it,' thought Captain Delano, "'that this helpless man is one of those paper captains I've known, "'who by policy wink at what by power they cannot put down?' I know no sadder sight than a commander who has little of command but the name. "'I should think, Don Benito,' he now said, glancing toward the oakum picker who had sought to interfere with the boys, "'that you would find it advantageous to keep all your blacks employed, especially the younger ones, no matter at what useless task, and no matter what happens to the ship. Why, even with my little band, I find such a course indispensable.' I once kept a crew on my quarter-deck thrumming mats for my cabin when for three days I had given up my ship, mats, men and all, for a speedy loss, owing to the violence of a gale in which we could do nothing but helplessly drive before it. Doubtless, doubtless, muttered Don Benito. But, continued Captain Delano, again glancing upon the oakum pickers, and then at the hatchet polishers nearby, I see you keep some at least of your host employed. Yes, was again the vacant response. Those old men there, shaking their pals from their pulpits, continued Captain Delano, pointed to the oakum pickers, seem to act the part of old dominies to the rest, little heeded as their admonitions are at times. Is this voluntary on their part, Don Benito, or have you appointed them shepherds to your flock of black sheep? What posts they feel I appointed them, rejoined the Spaniard in an acrid tone, as if resenting some supposed satiric reflection. "'And these others, these are shanty conjurers here,' continued Captain Delano, rather uneasily eyeing the brandished steel of the hatchet polishers, where in spots it had been brought to a shine. "'This seems a curious business there at Don Benito.' "'In the gales we met,' answered the Spaniard. "'What of our general cargo was not thrown overboard was much damaged by the brine. "'Since coming into calm weather I have had several cases of knives and hatchets daily brought up for overhauling and cleaning.' 
A prudent idea, Don Benito. You are part owner of ship and cargo, I presume, but not of the slaves, perhaps. I am owner of all you see, impatiently returned Don Benito, except the main company of blacks who belong to my late friend Alejandro Aranda. As he mentioned this name, his air was heartbroken, his knees shook, his servants supported him. Thinking he divined the cause of such unusual emotion, to confirm his surmise, Captain Delano, after a pause, said, And may I ask Don Benito whether, since a while ago you spoke of some cabin passengers, the friend whose loss so afflicts you at the outset of the voyage accompanied his blacks? Yes. But died of the fever? Died of the fever. Oh, could I but... Again quivering, the Spaniard paused. Pardon me said Captain Delano slowly, but I think that by a sympathetic experience I conjecture, Don Benito, what it is that gives the keener edge to your grief. It was once my hard fortune to lose at sea a dear friend, my own brother, then supercargo. Assured of the welfare of his spirit, its departure I could have borne like a man, but that honest eye, that honest hand, both of which had so often met mine, and that warm heart, all all like scraps to the dogs, to throw all to the sharks. It was then I vowed never to have for fellow voyager a man I loved, unless, unbeknown to him, I had provided every requisite in case of a fatality for embalming his mortal part for interment on shore. Will your friend remains now on board this ship, Don Benito, not thus strangely would the mention of his name affect you. On the board, this ship, echoed the Spaniard, then, with horrified gestures, as directed against some spectre, he unconsciously fell into the ready arms of his attendant, who, with a silent appeal toward Captain Delano, seemed beseeching him not again to approach a theme so unspeakably distressing to his master. This poor fellow now, thought the pained American, is the victim of that sad superstition which associates goblins with the deserted body of a man, as ghosts with an abandoned house. How unlike are we made! What to me, in like case, would have been a solemn satisfaction, the bare suggestion even, terrifies the Spaniard into this trance. Poor Alexandro Aranda, what would you say could you see your friend, who on former voyages, when you for months were left behind, has, I dare say, often longed and longed for one peep at you, now transported with terror at the least thought of having you any way nigh him? At this moment, with a dreary graveyard toll betokening a flaw, the ship's forecastle bell, smote by one of the grizzled oakum pickers, proclaimed ten o'clock through the leaden calm. When Captain Delano's attention was caught by the moving figure of a gigantic black emerging from the general crowd below and slowly advancing toward the elevated poop, an iron collar was about his neck, from which depended a chain thrice wound round his body, the terminating links padlocked together at a broad band of iron. His girdle. How like a mute out of all moves, murmured the servant. The black mounted the steps of the poop, and like a brave prisoner brought up to receive sentence, stood in unquailing muteness before Don Benito, now recovered from his attack. At the first glimpse of his approach, Don Benito had started, a resentful shadow swept over his face, and, as with the sudden memory of bootless rage, his white lips glued together. This is some mulish mutineer, thought Captain Delano, surveying, not without a mixture of admiration, the colossal form of the negro. See, he waits your question, master, said the servant. Thus reminded, Don Benito nervously averting his glance, as if shunning by anticipation some rebellious response, in a disconcerted voice thus spoke. Atofol, will you ask my pardon now? The black was silent. "'Again, master,' reported the servant, with bitter upbraiding eye in his countryman. "'Again, master, he will bend to master yet.' "'Answer,' said Don Benito, still averting his glance. "'Say but the one word pardon, and your chain shall be off.' Upon this the black, slowly raising both arms, let them lifelessly fall, his links clanking, his head bowed, as much as to say, "'No, I am content.' Go, said Don Benito, with inkept and unknown emotion. Deliberately as he had come, the black obeyed. Excuse me, Don Benito, said Captain Delano, but this scene surprises me. What means it, pray? 
It means that that negro alone of all the band has given me peculiar cause of offence. I have put him in chains. I— Here he paused, his hand to his head, as if there were swimming there, or a sudden bewilderment of memory had come over him. But meeting his servant's kindly glance seemed reassured, and proceeded. I could not scourge such a form, but I told him he must ask my pardon, and yet he has not. At my command, every two hours he stands before me. And how long has this been? Some sixty days. And obedient in all else, and respectful? Yes. Upon my conscience, then, exclaimed Captain Delano impulsively, he has a royal spirit in him, this fellow. He may have some right to it, bitterly returned Don Benito. He says he was king in his own land. "'Yes,' said the servant, entering the word. "'Those slits and out the falls ears once held wedges of gold. "'But poor Babo here in his own land was only a poor slave. "'A black man's slave was Babo, who now is the white.' "'Somewhat annoyed by these conversational familiarities, "'Captain Delano turned curiously upon the attendant, "'then glanced inquiringly at his master. But, as if long wanted to these little informalities, neither master nor man seemed to understand him. "'What, pray, was that of all's offence, Don Benito?' asked Captain Delano. "'If it was not something very serious, take a fool's advice, and in view of his general docility, as well as in some natural respect for his spirit, remit his penalty.' "'No, no, master will never do that,' here murmured the servant to himself. "'Proud Atafal must first ask master's pardon.' The slave there carries the padlock, but master here carries the key. His attention thus directed, Captain Delano now noticed for the first time that, suspended by a slender silken cord from Don Benito's neck, hung a key. At once, from the servant's muttered syllables divining the key's purpose, he smiled and said, So, Don Benito, padlock and key, symbolic symbols, truly. Biting his lip, Don Benito faltered. Though the remark of Captain Delano, a man of such native simplicity as to be incapable of satire or irony, had been dropped in playful allusion to the Spaniard's singularly evidenced lordship over the black, yet the hypochondriac seemed in some way to have taken it as a malicious reflection upon his confessed inability thus far to break down, at least on a verbal summons, the entrenched will of the slave. Deploring this supposed misconception, yet despairing of correcting it, Captain Delano shifted the subject, but finding his companion more than ever withdrawn, as if still slowly digesting the lees of the presumed affront above mentioned, by and by Captain Delano likewise became less talkative, oppressed against his own will, by what seemed the secret vindictiveness of the morbidly sensitive Spaniard. But the good sailor himself, of a quite contrary disposition, refrained on his part, alike from the appearances from the feeling of resentment, and, if silent, was only so from contagion. Presently the Spaniard, assisted by a servant, somewhat discourteously crossed over from Captain Delano, a procedure which, sensibly enough, might have been allowed to pass for idle caprice of ill-humour, had not master and man, lingering round the corner of the elevated skylight, begun whispering together in low voices. This was unpleasing, and more, the moody air of the Spaniard, which at times had not been without a sort of valetudinarian stateliness, now seemed anything but dignified, while the menial familiarity of the servant lost its original charm of simple-hearted attachment. End of chapter 4 Chapter 5 of Benito Sereno Questions in his embarrassment, the visitor turned his face to the other side of the ship. By so doing, his glance accidentally fell on a young Spanish sailor, a coil of rope in his hand, just stepped from the deck to the first round of the mizzen rigging. Perhaps the man would not have been particularly noticed were it not that, during his ascent to one of the yards, he, with a sort of covert intentness, kept his eye fixed on Captain Delano, from whom, presently, it passed, as if by a natural sequence, to the two whisperers. His own attention thus redirected to that quarter, Captain Delano gave a slight start, 
From something in Don Benito's manner just then, it seemed as if the visitor had, at least partly, been the subject of the withdrawn consultation going on, a conjecture as little agreeable to the guest as it was little flattering to the host. The singular alternations of courtesy and ill-breeding in the Spanish captain were unaccountable, except on one of two suppositions, innocent lunacy or wicked impostor. But the first idea, though it might naturally have occurred to an indifferent observer, and, in some respects, had not hitherto been wholly a stranger to Captain Delano's mind, yet now that, in an incipient way, he began to regard the stranger's conduct something in the light of an intentional affront, of course the idea of lunacy was virtually vacated. But if not a lunatic, what then? Under the circumstances, would a gentleman, nay, any honest boor, act the part now acted by his host? The man was an impostor, some low-born adventurer, masquerading as an oceanic grandee, yet so ignorant of the first requisites of mere gentlemanhood as to be betrayed into the present remarkable indecorum. That strange ceremoniousness, too, at other times evinced, seemed not uncharacteristic of one playing a part above his real level. Benito Sereno, Don Benito Sereno, a sounding name, one, too, at that period, not unknown in the surname to supercargoes and sea captains trading along the Spanish main, as belonging to one of the most enterprising and extensive mercantile families in all those provinces, several members of it having titles, a sort of Castilian Rothschild, with a noble brother or cousin in every great trading town of South America. The alleged Don Benito was in early manhood, about twenty-nine or thirty. To assume a sort of roving cadetship in the maritime affairs of such a house, what more likely scheme for a young knave of talent and spirit? But the Spaniard was a pale invalid. Never mind for even to the degree of simulating mortal disease the craft of some tricksters had been known to attain. To think that, under the aspect of infantile weakness, the most savage energies might be couched, those velvets of the Spaniard but the velvet paw to his fangs. From no train of thought did these fancies come, not from within, but from without. Suddenly, too, and in one throng, like hoar-frost, yet as soon to vanish as the mild sun of Captain Delano's good nature regained its meridian. Glancing over once again toward Don Benito, whose side face, revealed above the skylight, was now turned toward him, Captain Delano was struck by the profile, whose clearness of cut was refined by the thinness incident to ill health, as well as ennobled about the chin by the beard. Away with suspicion! He was a true offshoot of a true Hidalgo Sereno. Relieved by these and other better thoughts, the visitor, lightly humming a tune, now began indifferently pacing the poop so as not to betray to Don Benito that he had at all mistrusted incivility, much less duplicity. For such mistrust would yet be proved illusory, and by the event. Though, for the present, the circumstance which had provoked that distrust remained unexplained. But when that little mystery should have been cleared up, Captain Delano thought he might extremely regret it, did he allow Don Benito to become aware that he had indulged in ungenerous surmises. In short, to the Spaniard's black-letter text, it was best, for a while, to leave open margin. Presently, his pale face twitching and overcast, the Spaniard, still supported by his attendant, moved over toward his guest, when, with even more than unusual embarrassment and a strange sort of intriguing intonation in his husky whisper, the following conversation began. Senor, may I ask how long you have lain at this isle? Oh, but a day or two, Don Benito. And from what port are you last? Canton. And there, senor, you exchanged your seal skins for teas and silks, I think you said? Yes, 
silks mostly. And the balance you took in specie, perhaps? Captain Delano, fidgeting a little, answered, Yes, some silver, not a very great deal, though. Ah, well, may I ask how many men have you on board, senor? Captain Delano slightly started, but answered, About five and twenty, all told. And at present, senor, all on board, I suppose? All on board, Don Benito, replied the captain, now with satisfaction. And will be tonight, senor? At this last question, following so many pertinacious ones, for the soul of him Captain Delano could not but look very earnestly at the questioner, who, instead of meeting the glance with every token of craven discomposure, dropped his eyes to the deck, presenting an unworthy contrast to his servant who just then was kneeling at his feet, adjusting a loose shoe-buckle. His disengaged face, meantime, with humble curiosity, turned openly up into his master's downcast one. The Spaniard, still with a guilty shuffle, repeated his question. And, and will be tonight, senor? Yes, for aught I know, returned Captain Delano. But nay, rallying himself into fearless truth, some of them talked of going off on another fishing party about midnight. Your ships generally go, go more or less armed, I believe, senor? Oh, a six-pounder or two in case of emergency, was the intrepidly indifferent reply, with a small stock of muskets, sealing spears, and cutlasses, you know. As he thus responded, Captain Delano again glanced at Don Benito, but the latter's eyes were averted. While abruptly and awkwardly shifting the subject, he made some peevish allusion to the calm, and then, without apology, once more, with his attendant, withdrew to the opposite bulwarks, where the whispering was resumed. At this moment, and ere Captain Delano could cast a cool thought upon what had just passed, the young Spanish sailor before mentioned was seen descending from the rigging. In act of stooping over to spring inboard to the deck, his voluminous, unconfined frock or shirt of coarse woolen, much spotted with tar, opened out far down the chest, revealing a soiled undergarment of what seemed the finest linen, edged about the neck, with a narrow blue ribbon, sadly faded and worn. At this moment the young sailor's eye was again fixed on the whisperers, and Captain Delano thought he observed a lurking significance in it, as if silent signs of some Freemason sort had that instant been interchanged. This once more impelled his own glance in the direction of Don Benito, and, as before, he could not but infer that himself formed the subject of the conference. He paused. The sound of the hatchet polishing fell on his ears. He cast another swift side look at the two. They had the air of conspirators. In connection with the late questionings and the incident of the young sailor, these things now begat such return of involuntary suspicion that the singular guilelessness of the American could not endure it. Plucking up a gay and humorous expression, he crossed over to the two rapidly, saying, Ah, Don Benito, your black here seems high in your trust, a sort of privy counselor, in fact. Upon this, the servant looked up with a good-natured grin, but the master started as from a venomous bite. It was a moment or two before the Spaniard sufficiently recovered himself to reply, which he did at last, with cold constraint. Yes, senor, I have trust in Babo. Here, Babo, changing his previous grin of mere animal humor into an intelligent smile, not ungratefully eyed his master. Finding that the Spaniard now stood silent and reserved, as if involuntarily, or purposely giving hint that his guest's proximity was inconvenient just then, Captain Delano, unwilling to appear uncivil even to incivility itself, made some trivial remark and moved off, again and again turning over in his mind the mysterious demeanor of Don Benito Sereno. He had descended from the poop, and, wrapped in thought, 
was passing near a dark hatchway, leading down into the steerage, when, perceiving motion there, he looked to see what moved. The same instant there was a sparkle in the shadowy hatchway, and he saw one of the Spanish sailors prowling there, hurriedly placing his hand in the bosom of his frock, as if hiding something. Before the man could have been certain who it was that was passing, he slunk below out of sight. But enough was seen of him to make it sure that he was the same young sailor before noticed in the rigging. What was that which so sparkled, thought Captain Delano? It was no lamp, no match, no live coal. Could it have been a jewel? But how come sailors with jewels, or with silk-trimmed undershirts either? Has he been robbing the trunks of the dead cabin passengers? But if so, he would hardly wear one of the stolen articles on board ship here. Ah, ah, if now that was, indeed, a secret sign I saw passing between this suspicious fellow and his captain a while since. If I could only be certain that in my uneasiness my senses did not deceive me, then. Here, passing from one suspicious thing to another, his mind revolved the point of the strange questions put to him concerning his ship. By a curious coincidence, as each point was recalled, the black wizards of Ashanti would strike up with their hatchets as an ominous comment on the white stranger's thoughts. Pressed by such enigmas and portents, it would have been almost against nature, had not even into the least distrustful heart some ugly misgivings obtruded. Observing the ship now helplessly fallen into a current, with enchanted sails drifting with increased rapidity seaward, and noting that, from a lately intercepted projection of the land the sealer was hidden, the stout mariner began to quake at thoughts which he barely durst confess to himself. Above all, he began to feel a ghostly dread of Don Benito. And yet, when he roused himself, dilated his chest, felt himself strong on his legs, and coolly considered it, what did all these phantoms amount to? Had the Spaniard any sinister scheme, it must have reference not so much to him, Captain Delano, as to his ship, the Bachelor's Delight. Hence, the present drifting away of the one ship from the other, instead of favoring any such possible scheme, was, for the time at least, opposed to it. Clearly, any suspicion, combining such contradictions, must need be delusive. Beside, was it not absurd to think of a vessel in distress, a vessel by sickness almost dismanned of her crew, a vessel whose inmates were parched for water? Was it not a thousand times absurd that such a craft should, at present, be of a piratical character? Or her commander, either for himself or those under him, cherish any desire but for speedy relief and refreshment? But then, might not general distress, and thirst in particular, be affected? And might not that same undiminished Spanish crew, alleged to have perished off to a remnant, be at that very moment lurking in the hold? On heartbroken pretense of entreating a cup of cold water, fiends in human form had got into lonely dwellings, nor retired until a dark deed had been done. And among the Malay pirates, it was no unusual thing to lure ships after them into their treacherous harbors, or entice boarders from a declared enemy at sea by the spectacle of thinly manned or vacant decks, beneath which prowled a hundred spears with yellow arms ready to upthrust them through the mats. Not that Captain Delano had entirely credited such things. He had heard of them, and now, as stories, they recurred. The present destination of the ship was the anchorage. There she would be near his own vessel. Upon gaining that vicinity, might not the San Dominic, like a slumbering volcano, suddenly let loose energies now hid? He recalled the Spaniard's manner while telling his story. There was a gloomy hesitancy and subterfuge about it. It was just the manner of one making up his tale for evil purposes as he goes. But if that story was not true, what was the truth? That the ship had unlawfully come into the Spaniard's possession? 
But in many of its details, especially in reference to the more calamitous parts, such as the fatalities among the seamen, the consequent prolonged beating about, the past sufferings from obstinate calms, and still continued suffering from thirst, in all these points, as well as others, Don Benito's story had been corroborated not only by the wailing ejaculations of the indiscriminate multitude, white and black, but likewise what seemed impossible to be counterfeit, by the very expression and play of every human feature which Captain Delano saw. If Don Benito's story was throughout an invention, then every soul on board, down to the youngest negress, was his carefully drilled recruit in the plot an incredible inference, and yet, if there was ground for mistrusting the Spanish captain's veracity, that inference was a legitimate one. In short, scarce an uneasiness entered the honest sailor's mind, but, by a subsequent spontaneous act of good sense, it was ejected. At last he began to laugh at these forebodings, and laugh at the strange ship, for, in its aspect, some way siding with them, as it were, and laughed, too, at the odd-looking blacks, particularly those old scissors grinders, the Ashantis, and those bedridden old knitting women, the oakum pickers, and, in a human way, he almost began to laugh at the dark Spaniard himself, the central hobgoblin of all. For the rest, whatever in a serious way seemed enigmatical was now good-naturedly explained away by the thought that, for the most part, the poor invalid scarcely knew what he was about, either sulking in black vapors or putting random questions without sense or object. Evidently, for the present, the man was not fit to be entrusted with the ship. On some benevolent plea withdrawing the command from him, Captain Delano would yet have to send her to Concepcion, in charge of his second mate, a worthy person and good navigator, a plan which would prove no wiser for the San Dominic than for Don Benito, for, relieved from all anxiety, keeping wholly to his cabin, the sick man, under the good nursing of his servant, would probably, by the end of the passage, be in a measure restored to health, and with that he should also be restored to authority. End of chapter 5 Chapter 6 of Benito Sereno The Boat appears. Such were the Americans' thoughts. They were tranquilizing. There was a difference between the idea of Don Benito's darkly preordaining Captain Delano's fate and Captain Delano's lightly arranging Don Benito's. Nevertheless, it was not without something of relief that the good seaman presently perceived his whale-boat in the distance. Its absence had been prolonged by unexpected detention at the sealer's side, as well as its returning trip lengthened by the continual recession of the goal. The advancing speck was observed by the blacks. Their shouts attracted the attention of Don Benito, who, with a return of courtesy, approaching Captain Delano, expressed satisfaction at the coming of some supplies, slight and temporary as they must necessarily prove. Captain Delano responded, but while doing so, his attention was drawn to something passing on the deck below. Among the crowd climbing the landward bulwarks, anxiously watching the coming boat, two blacks, to all appearances accidentally incommoded by one of the sailors, flew out against him with horrible curses, which the sailor some way resenting, the two blacks dashed him to the deck and jumped upon him, despite the earnest cries of the oakum pickers. Don Benito, said Captain Delano quickly, do you see what is going on there? Look! But, seized by his cough, the Spaniard staggered with both hands to his face, on the point of falling. Captain Delano would have supported him, but the servant was more alert, who, with one hand sustaining his master, with the other applied the cordial. Don Benito restored, the black withdrew his support, slipping aside a little, but dutifully remaining within call of a whisper. Such discretion was here evinced as quite wiped away, in the visitor's eyes, any blemish of impropriety 
which might have attached to the attendant, from the indecorous conferences before mentioned, showing, too, that if the servant were to blame, it might be more the master's fault than his own, since, when left to himself, he could conduct thus well. His glance thus called away from the spectacle of disorder to the more pleasing one before him, Captain Delano could not avoid again congratulating Don Benito upon possessing such a servant, who, though perhaps a little too forward now and then, must upon the whole be invaluable to one in the invalid's situation. "'Tell me, Don Benito,' he added with a smile, "'I should like to have your man here myself. What will you take for him?' Would fifty doubloons be any object? Master wouldn't part with Babo for a thousand doubloons, murmured the black, overhearing the offer, and taking it in earnest, and, with the strange vanity of a faithful slave appreciated by his master, scorning to hear so paltry a valuation put upon him by a stranger. But Don Benito, apparently hardly yet completely restored, and again interrupted by his cough, made but some broken reply. Soon his physical distress became so great, affecting his mind too apparently, that, as if to screen the sad spectacle, the servant gently conducted his master below. Left to himself, the American, to while away the time till his boat should arrive, would have pleasantly accosted some one of the few Spanish seamen he saw but recalling something that Don Benito had said touching their ill conduct, he refrained, as a shipmaster indisposed to countenance cowardice or unfaithfulness in seamen. While, with these thoughts, standing with eye directed forward toward that handful of sailors, suddenly he thought that some of them returned the glance and with a sort of meaning. He rubbed his eyes and looked again, but again seemed to see the same thing under a new form, but more obscure than any previous one, the old suspicions recurred, but, in the absence of Don Benito, with less of panic than before. Despite the bad account given of the sailors, Captain Delano resolved forthwith to accost one of them. Descending the poop, he made his way through the blacks, his movement drawing a queer cry from the oakum pickers, prompted by whom the negroes, twitching each other aside, divided before him. But, as if curious to see what was the object of this deliberate visit to their ghetto, closing in behind, in tolerable order, followed the white stranger up. His progress thus proclaimed as by mounted kings at arms, and escorted as by a Kaffir guard of honor, Captain Delano, assuming a good-humored, off-hand air, continued to advance now and then saying a blithe word to the negroes, and his eye curiously surveying the white faces, here and there sparsely mixed in with the blacks, like stray white pawns, venturously involved in the ranks of the chessmen opposed. While thinking which of them to select for his purpose, he chanced to observe a sailor seated on the deck engaged in tarring the strap of a large block, with a circle of blacks squatted round him inquisitively eyeing the process. The mean employment of the man was in contrast with something superior in his figure. His hand, black with continually thrusting it into the tar-pot held for him by a negro, seemed not naturally allied to his face, a face which would have been a very fine one but for its haggardness. Whether this haggardness had aught to do with criminality could not be determined, since, as intense heat and cold, though unlike, produce like sensations, so innocence and guilt, when, through casual association with mental pain, stamping any visible impress, use one seal, a hacked one. Not again that this reflection occurred to Captain Delano at the time, charitable man as he was, rather another idea because observing so singular a haggardness to be combined with a dark eye, averted as in trouble and shame, and then, however illogically, uniting in his mind his own private suspicions of the crew with the confessed ill opinion on the part of their captain, he was insensibly operated upon by certain general notions, which, while disconnecting pain and abashment from virtue, 
as invariably link them with vice. If, indeed, there be any wickedness on board this ship, thought Captain Delano, be sure that man there has fouled his hand in it, even as now he fouls it in the pitch. I don't like to accost him. I will speak to this other, this old Jack here on the windlass. He advanced to an old Barcelona tar, in ragged red breeches and dirty nightcap, cheeks trenched and bronzed, whiskers dense as thorn hedges. Seated between two sleepy-looking Africans, this mariner, like his younger shipmate, was employed upon some rigging, splicing a cable, the sleepy-looking blacks performing the inferior function of holding the outer parts of the ropes for him. Upon Captain Delano's approach, the man at once hung his head below its previous level, the one necessary for business. It appeared as if he desired to be thought absorbed, with more than common fidelity, in his task. Being addressed, he glanced up, but with what seemed a furtive, diffident air, which sat strangely enough on his weather-beaten visage, much as if a grizzly bear, instead of growling and biting, should simper and cast sheep's eyes. He was asked several questions concerning the voyage, questions purposely referring to several particulars in Don Benito's narrative, not previously corroborated by those impulsive cries greeting the visitor on first coming on board. The questions were briefly answered, confirming all that remained to be confirmed of the story. The negroes about the windlass joined in with the old sailor, but, as they became talkative, he by degrees became mute, and at length quite glum, seemed morosely unwilling to answer more questions, and yet, all the while, this ursine air was somehow mixed with his sheepish one. Despairing of getting into unembarrassed talk with such a centaur, Captain Delano, after glancing round for a more promising countenance, but seeing none, spoke pleasantly to the blacks, to make way for him, and so, amid various grins and grimaces, returned to the poop, feeling a little strange at first. He could hardly tell why, but upon the whole, with regained confidence in Benito Sereno. How plainly, thought he, did that old whiskerando yonder betray a consciousness of ill desert. No doubt when he saw me coming he dreaded lest I, apprised by his captain of the crew's general misbehavior, came with sharp words for him, and so down with his head. And yet, and yet, now that I think of it, that very old fellow, if I err not, was one of those who seemed so earnestly eyeing me here a while since. Ah, these currents spin one's head round almost as much as they do the ship. Huh, there now's a pleasant sort of sunny sight. Quite sociable, too. His attention had been drawn to a slumbering negress partly disclosed through the lace-work of some rigging, lying with youthful limbs, carelessly disposed, under the lee of the bulwarks, like a doe in the shade of a woodland rock. Sprawling at her lapped breasts was her wide-awake fawn, stark naked, its black little body half-lifted from the deck, crosswise with its dams, its hands like two paws clambering upon her its mouth and nose ineffectually rooting to get at the mark, and meantime giving a vexatious half-grunt, blending with the composed snore of the negress. The uncommon vigor of the child at length roused the mother. She started up, at distance facing Captain Delano, but, as if not at all concerned at the attitude in which she had been caught, delightedly she caught the child up, with maternal transports, covering it with kisses. There's naked nature now. Pure tenderness and love, thought Captain Delano, well pleased. This incident prompted him to remark the other negresses more particularly than before. He was gratified with their manners. Like most uncivilized women, they seemed at once tender of heart and tough of constitution, equally ready to die for their infants or fight for them unsophisticated as leopardesses, loving as doves. Ah, thought Captain Delano, 
These, perhaps, are some of the very women whom Mungo Park saw in Africa, and gave such a noble account of. These natural sights somehow insensibly deepened his confidence and ease. At last he looked to see how his boat was getting on, but it was still pretty remote. He turned to see if Don Benito had returned, but he had not. To change the scene, as well as to please himself with a leisurely observation of the coming boat, stepping over into the mizzen chains, he clambered his way into the starboard quarter galley, one of those abandoned Venetian-looking water balconies previously mentioned, retreats cut off from the deck. As his foot pressed the half-damp, half-dry sea mosses matting the place, and a chance phantom cat's paw, an islet of breeze, unheralded, unfollowed, as this ghostly cat's paw came fanning his cheek, his glance fell upon the row of small round dead lights, all closed like coppered eyes of the coffin, and the state cabin door once connecting with the gallery, even as the dead lights had once looked out upon it, but now cocked fast like a sarcophagus lid to a purple-black tarred-over panel, threshold, and post. And he bethought him of the time when that state cabin and the state balcony had heard the voices of the Spanish king's officers, and the forms of the Lima Viceroy's daughters had perhaps leaned where he stood. As these and other images flitted through his mind, as the cat's paw through the calm, gradually he felt rising a dreamy inquietude, like that of one who alone on the prairie feels unrest from the repose of the noon. He leaned against the carved balustrade, again looking off toward his boat, but found his eye falling upon the ribboned grass, trailing along the ship's waterline, straight as a border of green box, and parterres of seaweed, broad ovals and crescents, floating nigh and far, with what seemed long formal alleys between, crossing the terraces of swells, and sweeping round as if leading to the grottoes below. And overhanging all was the balustrade by his arm, which, partly stained with pitch and partly embossed with moss, seemed the charred ruin of some summer-house in a grand garden long running to waste. Trying to break one charm, he was but becharmed anew, though upon the wide sea he seemed in some far inland country, prisoner in some deserted chateau, left to stare at empty grounds, and peer out at vague roads where never wagon or wayfarer passed. But these enchantments were a little disenchanted as his eye fell on the corroded main chains, of an ancient style, massy and rusty in link, shackle and bolt, they seemed even more fit for the ship's present business than the one for which probably she had been built. Presently, he thought something moved nigh the chains. He rubbed his eyes and looked hard. Groves of rigging were about the chains, and there, peering from behind a great stay, like an Indian from behind a hemlock, a Spanish sailor, a marling spike in his hand, was seen, who made what seemed an imperfect gesture toward the balcony. But immediately, as if alarmed by some advancing step along the deck within, vanished into the recesses of the hempen forest, like a poacher. What meant this? Something the man had sought to communicate, unbeknown to anyone, even to his captain? Did the secret involve aught unfavorable to his captain? Were those previous misgivings of Captain Delano's about to be verified? Or, in his haunted mood at the moment, had some random, unintentional motion of the man, while busy with the stay, as if repairing it, been mistaken for a significant beckoning? Not unbewildered, again he gazed off for his boat, but it was temporarily hidden by a rocky spur of the isle. As with some eagerness he bent forward, Watching for the first shooting view of its beak, the balustrade gave way before him like charcoal. Had he not clutched an outreaching rope, he would have fallen into the sea. The crash, though feeble, and the fall, though hollow, of the rotten fragments 
must have been overheard. He glanced up. With sober curiosity, peering down upon him, was one of the old oakum pickers, slipped from his perch to an outside boom, while below the old negro, and, invisible to him, reconnoitering from a porthole like a fox from the mouth of its den, crouched the Spanish sailor again. From something suddenly suggested by the man's air, the mad idea now darted into Captain Delano's mind, that Don Benito's plea of indisposition, in withdrawing below, was but a pretense, that he was engaged there maturing some plot of which the sailor, by some means gaining an inkling, had a mind to warn the stranger against, incited, it may be, by gratitude for a kind word on first boarding the ship. Was it from foreseeing some possible interference like this that Don Benito had beforehand given such a bad character of his sailors, while praising the Negroes, though indeed the former seemed as docile as the latter the contrary? The whites, too, by nature, were the shrewder race. A man with some evil design would not he be likely to speak well of that stupidity which was blind to his depravity, and malign that intelligence from which it might not be hidden? Not unlikely, perhaps, but if the whites had dark secrets concerning Don Benito, could then Don Benito be any way in complicity with the blacks? But they were too stupid. Besides, who ever heard of a white so far a renegade as to apostatize from his very species almost by leaguing in against it with negroes. These difficulties recalled former ones. Lost in their mazes, Captain Delano, who had now regained the deck, was uneasily advancing along it, when he observed a new face, an aged sailor seated cross-legged near the main hatchway. His skin was shrunk up with wrinkles like a pelican's empty pouch, his hair frosted, his countenance grave and composed. His hands were full of ropes, which he was working into a large knot. Some blacks were about him, obligingly dipping the strands for him here and there, as the exigencies of the operation demanded. Captain Delano crossed over to him, and stood in silence surveying the knot. His mind, by a not uncongenial transition, passing from its own entanglements to those of the hemp. For intricacy, such a knot he had never seen in an American ship, or indeed any other. The old man looked like an Egyptian priest making Gordian knots for the temple of Amon. The knot seemed a combination of double bowline knot, treble crown knot, backhanded well knot, knot in and out knot, and jamming knot. At last, puzzled to comprehend the meaning of such a knot, Captain Delano addressed the knotter. "'What are you knotting there, my man?' "'The knot,' was the brief reply, without looking up. "'So it seems, but what is it for?' "'For someone else to undo,' muttered back the old man, plying his fingers harder than ever, the knot being now nearly completed. While Captain Delano stood watching him, Suddenly the old man threw the knot toward him, and said in broken English, the first heard in the ship, something to this effect. Undo it. Cut it quick. It was said lowly, but with such condensation of rapidity, that the long, slow words in Spanish, which had preceded and followed, almost operated as covers to the brief English between. For a moment, not in hand and not in head, Captain Delano stood mute, while, without further heeding him, the old man was now intent upon other ropes. Presently there was a slight stir behind Captain Delano. Turning, he saw the chained negro, Atufal, standing quietly there, the next moment the old sailor rose, muttering, and, followed by his subordinate negroes, removed to the forward part of the ship, where, in the crowd, he disappeared. 
An elderly negro, in a clout like an infant's, and with a pepper-and-salt head, and a kind of attorney air, now approached Captain Delano. In tolerable Spanish, and with a good-natured knowing wink, he informed him that the old knotter was simple-witted, but harmless, often playing his old tricks. The negro concluded by begging the knot, for, of course, the stranger would not care to be troubled with it. Unconsciously, it was handed to him. With a sort of conga, the negro received it, and, turning his back, ferreted into it like a detective custom-house officer, after smuggled laces. Soon, with some African word equivalent to psh, he tossed the knot overboard. End of Chapter 6 Chapter 7 of Benito Sereno The Boat Arrives All this is very queer now, thought Captain Delano, with a qualmish sort of emotion. But as one feeling incipient seasickness, he strove, by ignoring the symptoms, to get rid of the malady. Once more he looked off for his boat. To his delight, it was now again in view, leaving the rocky spur astern. The sensation here experienced, after at first relieving his uneasiness with unforeseen efficiency, soon began to remove it. The less distant sight of that well-known boat, showing it, not as before, half blended with the haze, but with outline defined, so that its individuality, like a man's, was manifest. That boat, Rover by name, which, though now in strange seas, had often pressed the beach of Captain Delano's home, and, brought to its threshold for repairs, had familiarly lain there as a Newfoundland dog. The sight of that household boat evoked a thousand trustful associations which, contrasted with previous suspicions, filled him not only with lightsome confidence, but somehow with half-humorous self-reproaches at his former lack of it. What I, Amasa Delano, Jack of the Beach, as they called me when a lad, I, Amasa, the same that, duck satchel in hand, used to paddle along the waterside to the schoolhouse made from the old hulk, I, little Jack of the Beach, that used to go burying with Cousin Nat and the rest, I, to be murdered here at the ends of the earth, on board a haunted pirate ship by a horrible Spaniard? Too nonsensical to think of. Who would murder Amasa Delano? His conscience is clean. There is someone above. Fie, fie, Jack of the Beach. You are a child indeed, a child of the second childhood, old boy. You are beginning to dote and drool, I'm afraid. Light of heart and foot, he stepped aft, and there was met by Don Benito's servant, who, with a pleasing expression, responsive to his own present feelings, informed him that his master had recovered from the effects of his coughing fit, and had just ordered him to go present his compliments to his good guest, Don Amasa, and say that he, Don Benito, would soon have the happiness to rejoin him. There, now, do you mark that? Again, thought Captain Delano, walking the poop. What a donkey I was! This kind gentleman who here sends me his kind compliments, he but ten minutes ago, dark lantern in hand, was dodging round some old grindstone in the hold, sharpening a hatchet for me, I thought. Well, well, these long calms have a morbid effect on the mind, I've often heard, though I never believed it before. Huh, glancing toward the boat. There's Rover, a good dog, a white bone in her mouth, a pretty big bone, though, seems to me. What? Yes, she has fallen afoul of the bubbling tide rip there. It sets her the other way, too, for the time. Patience. It was now about noon, though, from the grayness of everything, it seemed to be getting toward dusk. The calm was confirmed. In the far distance, away from the influence of land, the leaden ocean seemed laid out, and let it up, its course finished, soul gone, defunct. 
but the current from landward, where the ship was, increased, silently sweeping her further and further toward the tranced waters beyond. Still, from his knowledge of those latitudes, cherishing hopes of a breeze and a fair and fresh one at any moment, Captain Delano, despite present prospects, buoyantly counted upon bringing the San Dominique safely to anchor ere night. The distance swept over was nothing, since, with a good wind, ten minutes sailing would retrace more than sixty minutes drifting. Meantime, one moment turning to Mark Rover fighting the tide-rip, and the next to see Don Benito approaching, he continued walking the poop. Gradually he felt a vexation arising from the delay of his boat. This soon merged into uneasiness, and at last his eye falling continually, as from a stage-box into the pit, upon the strange crowd before and below him, and by and by recognizing there the face, now composed to indifference, of the Spanish sailor who had seemed to beckon from the main chains, something of his old trepidations returned. Ah, thought he, gravely enough, this is like the ague. Because it went off, it follows not that it won't come back. Though ashamed of the relapse, he could not altogether subdue it. And so, exerting his good nature to the utmost, insensibly he came to a compromise. Yes, this is a strange craft, a strange history, too, and strange folks on board. But nothing more. By way of keeping his mind out of mischief till the boat should arrive, he tried to occupy it with turning over and over, in a purely speculative sort of way, some lesser peculiarities of the captain and crew. Among others, four curious points recurred. First, the affair of the Spanish lad assailed with a knife by the slave boy, an act winked at by Don Benito. Second, the tyranny in Don Benito's treatment of Atufal, the black, as if a child should lead a bull of the Nile by the ring in his nose. Third, the trampling of the sailor by the two negroes, a piece of insolence passed over without so much as a reprimand. Fourth, the cringing submission to their master of all the ship's underlings, mostly blacks, as if by the least inadvertence they fear to draw down his despotic displeasure. Coupling these points, they seem somewhat contradictory. But what then, thought Captain Delano, glancing toward his now nearing boat, what then? Why, this Don Benito is a very capricious commander. But he is not the first of the sort I have seen, though it's true he rather exceeds any other. But as a nation, continued he in his reveries, these Spaniards are all an odd set. The very word Spaniard has a curious, conspirator, guy fawkish twang to it. And yet, I dare say, Spaniards in the main are as good folks as any in Dukesbury, Massachusetts. Ah, good. At last, Rover has come. As, with its welcome freight, the boat touched the side, the oakum pickers, with venerable gestures, sought to restrain the blacks, who, at the sight of three gurried water casks in its bottom, and a pile of wilted pumpkins in its bow, hung over the bulwarks in disorderly raptures. Don Benito, with his servant now appeared, his coming, perhaps, hastened by hearing the noise. Of him, Captain Delano sought permission to serve out the water, so that all might share alike and none injure themselves by unfair excess. But sensible, and, on Don Benito's account, kind as this offer was, it was received with what seemed impatience, as if aware that he lacked energy as a commander, Don Benito, with the true jealousy of weakness, resented as an affront any interference. So at least Captain Delano inferred. In another moment the casks were being hoisted in, when some of the eager negroes accidentally jostled Captain Delano where he stood by the gangway, so that, unmindful of Don Benito, yielding to the impulse of the moment with good-natured authority, he bade the blacks stand back. To enforce his words, making use of a half-mirthful, 
half-menacing gesture. Instantly the blacks paused, just where they were, each negro and negress suspended in his or her posture, exactly as the word had found them, for a few seconds continuing so, while, as between the responsive posts of a telegraph, an unknown syllable ran from man to man among the perched oakum pickers. While Captain Delano's attention was fixed by this scene, suddenly the hatchet polishers half rose, and a rapid cry came from Don Benito. Thinking that at the signal of the Spaniard he was about to be massacred, Captain Delano would have sprung for his boat, but paused as the oakum pickers, dropping down into the crowd with earnest exclamations, forced every white and every negro back at the same moment with gestures friendly and familiar, almost jocose, bidding him in substance not be a fool. Simultaneously, the hatchet polishers resumed their seats quietly as so many tailors, and at once, as if nothing had happened, the work of hoisting in the casks was resumed, whites and blacks singing at the tackle. Captain Delano glanced toward Don Benito. As he saw his meager form in the act of recovering itself from reclining in the servant's arms into which the agitated invalid had fallen, he could not but marvel at the panic by which himself had been surprised on the darting supposition that such a commander, who, upon a legitimate occasion, so trivial too, as it now appeared, could lose all self-command, was, with energetic iniquity, going to bring about his murder. The casks being on deck, Captain Delano was handed a number of jars and cups by one of the steward's aides, who, in the name of Don Benito, entreated him to do as he had proposed, dole out the water. He complied with Republican impartiality as to this Republican element, which always seeks one level, serving the oldest white no better than the youngest black, excepting, indeed, poor Don Benito, whose condition, if not rank, demanded an extra allowance. To him, in the first place, Captain Delano presented a fair pitcher of the fluid, but thirsting as he was for fresh water, Don Benito quaffed not a drop until after several grave bows and salutes, a reciprocation of courtesies which the sight-loving Africans hailed with clapping of hands. Two of the less wilted pumpkins being reserved for the cabin table, the residue were minced up on the spot for the general regalement. But the soft bread, sugar, and bottled cider Captain Delano would have given the Spaniards alone, and in chief Don Benito, but the latter objected, which disinterestedness on his part not a little pleased the American, and so mouthfuls all around were given alike to whites and blacks, excepting one bottle of cider, which Babo insisted upon setting aside for his master. Here it may be observed that as, on the first visit of the boat, the American had not permitted his men to board the ship, neither did he now, being unwilling to add to the confusion of the decks. Not uninfluenced by the peculiar good humor at present prevailing, and for the time oblivious of any but benevolent thoughts, Captain Delano, who from recent indications counted upon a breeze within an hour or two at furthest, dispatched the boat back to the sealer, with orders for all the hands that could be spared immediately to set about rafting casks to the watering place and filling them. Likewise, he bade word be carried to his chief officer that, if against present expectation the ship was not brought to anchor by sunset, he need be under no concern, for, as there was to be a full moon that night, he, Captain Delano, would remain on board, ready to play the pilot, should the wind come soon or late. As the two captains stood together observing the departing boat, the servant, as it happened, having just spied a spot on his master's velvet sleeve and silently engaged rubbing it out, the American expressed his regrets that the San Dominic had no boats, none at least but the unseaworthy old hulk of the longboat, which, warped as a camel skeleton in the desert and almost as bleached, lay potwise inverted amidships, one side a little tipped, furnishing a subterraneous sort of den for family groups of the blacks, mostly women and small children, who, squatting on old mats below, 
or perched above in the dark dome on the elevated seats, were descried, some distance within, like a social circle of bats, sheltering in some friendly cave, at intervals, ebon flights of naked boys and girls, three or four years old, darting in and out of the den's mouth. "'Had you three or four boats now, Don Benito,' said Captain Delano, "'I think that, by tugging at the oars, your negroes here might help along matters some. "'Did you sail from port without boats, Don Benito?' "'They were stove in the gales, senor. "'That was bad. Many men, too, you lost then. Boats and men. "'Those must have been hard gales, Don Benito.' "'Past all speech,' cringed the Spaniard. "'Tell me, Don Benito,' continued his companion with increased interest, "'tell me, were these gales immediately off the pitch of Cape Horn?' "'Cape Horn? Who spoke of Cape Horn?' "'Yourself did, when giving me an account of your voyage,' answered Captain Delano, with almost equal astonishment at this eating of his own words, even as he ever seemed eating his own heart on the part of the Spaniard. You yourself, Don Benito, spoke of Cape Horn, he emphatically repeated. The Spaniard turned, in a sort of stooping posture, pausing an instant, as one about to make a plunging exchange of elements, as from air to water. End of Chapter 7 Chapter 8 In the Cuddy at this moment a messenger boy, a white, hurried by in the regular performance of his function carrying the last expired half-hour forward to the forecastle from the cabin timepiece to have it struck at the ship's large bell. Master, said the servant, discontinuing his work on the coat sleeve and addressing the rapt Spaniard with a sort of timid apprehensiveness, as one charged with a duty the discharge of which it was foreseen would prove irksome to the very person who had imposed it and for whose benefit it was intended master told me never mind where he was or how engaged always to remind him to a minute when shaving time comes miguel has gone to strike the half hour after noon it is now master will master go into the cuddy ah yes answered the spaniard starting somewhat as from dreams into realities then turning upon captain delano he said that ere long he would resume the conversation then if master means to talk more to don amasa said the servant why not let don amasa sit by master in the cuddy and master can talk and don amasa can listen while babo here lathers and strops yes said captain delano not unpleased with this sociable plan yes don benito unless you had rather not i will go with you be it so senor as the three passed aft the american could not but think it another strange instance of his host's capriciousness this being shaved with such uncommon punctuality in the middle of the day but he deemed it more than likely that the servant's anxious fidelity had something to do with the matter inasmuch as the timely interruption served to rally his master from the mood which had evidently been coming upon him the place called the cuddy was a light deck cabin formed by the poop a sort of attic to the large cabin below part of it had formerly been the quarters of the officers but since their death all the partitionings had been thrown down and the whole interior converted into one spacious and airy marine hall for absence of fine furniture and picturesque disarray of odd appurtenances somewhat answering to the wide cluttered hall of some eccentric bachelor squire in the country who hangs his shooting jacket and tobacco pouch on deer antlers and keeps his fishing rod tongs and walking stick in the same corner the similitude was heightened, if not originally suggested, by glimpses of the surrounding sea, since in one aspect the country and the ocean seem cousins German. The floor of the cuddy was matted. Overhead, four or five old muskets were stuck into horizontal holes along the beams, 
On one side was a claw-footed old table lashed to the deck, a thumbed missile on it, and over it a small, meager crucifix attached to the bulkhead. Under the table lay a dented cutlass or two, with a hacked harpoon among some melancholy old rigging, like a heap of poor friar's girdles. There were also two long, sharp-ribbed settees of malacca cane, black with age and uncomfortable to look at as inquisitor's racks, with a large misshapen armchair, which, furnished with a rude barber's crutch at the back, working with a screw, seemed some grotesque middle-age engine of torment. A flag-locker was in one corner, exposing various colored bunting, some rolled up, others half unrolled, still others tumbled. Opposite was a cumbrous washstand of black mahogany, all of one block, with a pedestal, like a font, and over it a railed shelf containing combs, brushes, and other implements of the toilet. A tom hammock of stained grass swung near, the sheets tossed, and the pillow wrinkled up like a brow, as if whoever slept here slept but illly, with alternate visitations of sad thoughts and bad dreams. The further extremity of the cuddy, overhanging the ship's stern, was pierced with three openings, windows or portholes, according as men or cannon might peer, socially or unsocially, out of them. At present neither men nor cannon were seen, though huge ring-bolts and other rusty iron fixtures of the woodwork hinted of twenty-four pounders. Glancing toward the hammock as he entered, Captain Delano said, you sleep here, Don Benito? Yes, senor, since we got into mild weather. This seems a sort of dormitory, sitting room, sail loft, chapel, armory, and private closet together, Don Benito, added Captain Delano, looking around. Yes, senor, events have not been favorable to much order in my arrangements. Here the servant, napkin on arm made a motion as if waiting his master's good pleasure don benito signified his readiness when seating him in the malacca armchair and for the guest's convenience drawing opposite it one of the settees the servant commenced operations by throwing back his master's collar and loosening his cravat there is something in the negro which in a peculiar way fits him for avocations about one's person. Most Negroes are natural valets and hairdressers, taking to the comb and brush congenially as to the castanets, and flourishing them apparently with almost equal satisfaction. There is, too, a smooth tact about them in this employment, with a marvelous, noiseless, gliding briskness not ungraceful in his way, singularly pleasing to behold, and still more so to be the manipulated subject of. And above all is the great gift of good humor. Not the mere grin or laugh is here meant. Those were unsuitable. But a certain easy cheerfulness, harmonious in every glance and gesture, as though God had set the whole negro to some pleasant tune. When to all this is added the docility arising from the unaspiring contentment of a limited mind, and that susceptibility of blind attachment sometimes in hearing in indisputable inferiors, one readily perceives why those hypochondriacs, Johnson and Byron, it may be something like the hypochondriac, Benito Sereno, took to their hearts, almost to the exclusion of the entire white race, their serving men, the Negroes, Barber and Fletcher. But if there be that in the Negro which exempts him from the inflicted sourness of the morbid or cynical mind, how in his most prepossessing aspects must he appear 
to a benevolent one. When at ease with respect to exterior things, Captain Delano's nature was not only benign, but familiarly and humorously so. At home he had often taken rare satisfaction in sitting in his door, watching some free man of color at his work or play. If on a voyage he chanced to have a black sailor, invariably he was on chatty and half-gamesome terms with him. In fact, like most men of a good, blithe heart, Captain Delano took to Negroes, not philanthropically, but genially, just as other men to Newfoundland dogs. Hitherto the circumstances in which he found the San Dominic had repressed the tendency. But in the cuddy, relieved from his former uneasiness, and for various reasons, more sociably inclined than at any previous period of the day, and seeing the colored servant, napkin on arm, so debonair about his master, in a business so familiar as that of shaving, too, all his old weakness for Negroes returned. Among other things, he was amused with an odd instance of the African love of bright colors and fine shows, in the blacks informally taking from the flag locker a great piece of bunting of all hues and lavishly tucking it under his master's chin for an apron. The mode of shaving among the Spaniards is a little different from what it is with other nations. They have a basin, specially called a barber's basin, which on one side is scooped out so as accurately to receive the chin, against which it is closely held in lathering, which is done not with a brush, but with soap dipped in the water of the basin and rubbed on the face. In the present instance salt water was used for lack of better, and the parts lathered were only the upper lip and low down under the throat, all the rest being cultivated beard. These preliminaries being somewhat novel to Captain Delano, he sat curiously eyeing them, so that no conversation took place, nor for the present did Don Benito appear disposed to renew any. Setting down his basin, the negro searched among the razors, as for the sharpest, and having found it, gave it an additional edge by expertly stropping it on the firm, smooth, oily skin of his open palm. He then made a gesture as if to begin, but midway stood suspended for an instant, one hand elevating the razor, the other professionally dabbling among the bubbly suds on the Spaniard's lank neck. Not unaffected by the close sight of the gleaming steel, Don Benito nervously shuddered. His usual ghastliness was heightened by the lather, which lather again was intensified in its hue by the sootiness of the negro's body. Altogether the scene was somewhat peculiar, at least to Captain Delano, nor as he saw the two thus postured could he resist the vagary that in the black he saw a headsman, and in the white a man at the block. But this was one of those antic conceits, appearing and vanishing in a breath, from which perhaps the best regulated mind is not free. Meantime the agitation of the Spaniard had a little loosened the bunting from around him, so that one broad fold swept curtain-like over the chair-arm to the floor, revealing, amid a profusion of armorial bars and ground colors, black, blue, and yellow, a closed castle in a blood-red field diagonal with a lion rampant in a white. "'The castle and the lion!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'Why, Don Benito, this is the flag of Spain you use here. It's well, it's only I, and not the king that sees this,' he added with a smile. "'But,' turning toward the black, "'it's all one, I suppose, so the colors be gay,' which playful remark did not fail somewhat to tickle the negro. Now, master, he said, readjusting the flag and pressing the head gently further back into the crotch of the chair. Now, master, 
and the steel glanced nigh the throat. Again Don Benito faintly shuddered. You must not shake so, master. See, Don Amasa, master always shakes when I shave him, and yet master knows I never yet have drawn blood, though it's true, if master will shake so, I may some of these times. Now, master, he continued, and now, Don Amasa, please go on with your talk about the gale and all that. Master can hear, and between times master can answer. Ah, yes, these gales, said Captain Delano. But the more I think of your voyage, Don Benito, the more I wonder, not at the gales, terrible as they must have been, but at the disastrous interval following them. For here, by your account, have you been these two months, and more, getting from Cape Horn to St. Maria, a distance which I myself and a good wind have sailed in a few days. True, you had calms and long ones, but to be becalmed for two months, that is at least unusual. Why, Don Benito, had almost any other gentleman told me such a story, I should have been half disposed to a little incredulity. Here an involuntary expression came over the Spaniard, similar to that just before on the deck, and whether it was the start he gave, or a sudden gawky roll of the hull in the calm, or a momentary unsteadiness of the servant's hand, however it was, just then the razor drew blood, spots of which stained the creamy lather under the throat. Immediately the black barber drew back his steel, and remaining in his professional attitude, back to Captain Delano, and face to Don Benito, held up the trickling razor, saying with a sort of half humorous sorrow, See, master, you shook so. Here's Babo's first blood. No sword drawn before James I of England, no assassination in that timid king's presence, could have produced a more terrified aspect than was now presented by Don Benito. Poor fellow, thought Captain Delano so nervous he can't even bear the sight of barber's blood and this unstrung sick man is it credible that i should have imagined he meant to spill all my blood who can't endure the sight of one little drop of his own surely amasa delano you have been beside yourself this day tell it not when you get home sappy amasa well well he looks like a murderer does he more like as if himself were to be done for. Well, well, this day's experience shall be a good lesson. Meantime, while these things were running through the honest seaman's mind, the servant had taken the napkin from his arm, and to Don Benito had said, But answer, Don Amasa, please, master, while I wipe this ugly stuff off the razor and strop it again. As he said these words, his face was turned half round, so as to be alike visible to the Spaniard and the American, and seemed by its expression to hint that he was desirous, by getting his master to go on with the conversation, considerately to withdraw his attention from the recent annoying accident. As if glad to snatch the offered relief, Don Benito resumed, rehearsing to Captain Delano, that not only were the calms of unusual duration, but the ship had fallen in with obstinate currents and other things, he added, some of which were but repetitions of former statements, to explain how it came to pass that the passage from Cape Horn to St. Maria had been so exceedingly long, now and then mingling with his words incidental praises, less qualified than before, to the blacks for their general good conduct. These particulars were not given consecutively, the servant now and then using his razor, and so between the intervals of shaving, the story and panegyric went on with more than usual huskiness. To Captain Delano's imagination, now again not wholly at rest, there was something so hollow in the Spaniard's manner, with apparently some reciprocal hollowness in the servant's dusky comment of silence, that the idea flashed across him that, possibly master and man, for some unknown purpose, were acting out 
both in word and deed, nay, to the very tremor of Don Benito's limbs, some juggling play before him. Neither did the suspicion of collusion lack apparent support from the fact of those whispered conferences before mentioned. But then, what could be the object of enacting this play of the barber before him? At last, regarding the notion as a whimsy insensibly suggested, perhaps, by the theatrical aspect of Don Benito in his Harlequin Ensign, Captain Delano speedily banished it. The shaving over, the servant bestirred himself with a small bottle of scented waters, pouring a few drops on the head, and then diligently rubbing the vehemence of the exercise causing the muscles of his face to twitch rather strangely. His next operation was with comb, scissors, and brush, going round and round, smoothing a curl here, clipping an unruly whisker hair there, giving a graceful sweep to the temple lock, with other impromptu touches evincing the hand of a master. While, like any resigned gentleman in barber's hands, Don Benito bore all much less uneasily, at least, than he had done the razoring, indeed he sat so pale and rigid now that the negro seemed a Nubian sculptor finishing off a white statue head. All being over at last, the standard of Spain removed, tumbled up and tossed back into the flag-locker, the negro's warm breath blowing away any stray hair which might have lodged down his master's neck, collar and cravat readjusted, a speck of lint whisked off the velvet lapel, all this being done, backing off a little space and pausing with an expression of subdued self-complacency, the servant for a moment surveyed his master as in toilet at least, the creature of his own tasteful hands. Captain Delano playfully complimented him upon his achievement, at the same time congratulating Don Benito. But neither sweet waters, nor shampooing, nor fidelity, nor sociality delighted the Spaniard. Seeing him relapsing into forbidding gloom and still remaining seated, Captain Delano, thinking that his presence was undesired just then, withdrew on pretense of seeing whether, as he had prophesied, any signs of a breeze were visible. Walking forward toward the mainmast, he stood a while thinking over the scene, and not without some undefined misgivings, when he heard a noise near the cuddy, and turning saw the negro, his hand to his cheek. Advancing, Captain Delano perceived that the cheek was bleeding. He was about to ask the cause when the negro's wailing soliloquy enlightened him. Ah, when will master get better from his sickness? Only the sour heart that sour sickness breeds made him serve Babo so, cutting Babo with the razor, because only by accident Babo had given master one little scratch and for the first time in so many a day, too. Ah! 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 Holding his hand to his face. Is it possible, thought Captain Delano, was it to wreck in private this Spanish spite against this poor friend of his, that Don Benito, by his sullen manner, impelled me to withdraw? Ah, this slavery breeds ugly passions in man. Poor fellow. He was about to speak in sympathy to the negro, but with a timid reluctance he now re-entered the cuddy. Presently master and man came forth, Don Benito leaning on his servant as if nothing had happened. But a sort of love quarrel after all, thought Captain Delano. He accosted Don Benito, and they slowly walked together. They had gone but a few paces when the steward, a tall, raja-looking mulatto, orientally set off with a pagoda turban formed by three or four madras handkerchiefs wound about his head, tier on tier. 
approaching with a salam, announced lunch in the cabin. On their way thither, the two captains were preceded by the mulatto, who, turning round as he advanced with continual smiles and bows, ushered them in, a display of elegance which quite completed the insignificance of the small bareheaded babo, who, as if not unconscious of inferiority, eyed askance the graceful steward. But in part, Captain Delano imputed his jealous watchfulness to that peculiar feeling which the full-blooded African entertains for the adulterated one. As for the steward, his manner, if not bespeaking much dignity of self-respect, yet evidenced his extreme desire to please, which is doubly meritorious, as at once Christian and Chesterfieldian. Captain Delano observed with interest that while the complexion of the mulatto was hybrid, his physiognomy was European, classically so. Don Benito, whispered he, I am glad to see this usher of the goldenrod of yours. The sight refutes an ugly remark once made to me by a Barbados planter, that when a mulatto has a regular European face, look out for him, he is a devil. But see, your steward here has features more regular than King George's of England, and yet here he nods and bows and smiles, a king indeed, the king of kind hearts and polite fellows. What a pleasant voice he has, too. He has, senor. But tell me, has he not, so far as you have known him, always proved a good, worthy fellow, said Captain Delano, pausing while with a final genuflection the steward disappeared into the cabin. Come, for the reason just mentioned, I am curious to know. Francesco is a good man, rather sluggishly responded Don Benito, like a phlegmatic appreciator who would neither find fault nor flatter. Ah, I thought so, for it were strange indeed and not very creditable to us white skins if a little of our blood mixed with the Africans should, far from improving the latter's quality, have the sad effect of pouring vitriolic acid into black broth, improving the hue, perhaps, but not the wholesomeness. Doubtless, doubtless, senor, but, glancing at Babo, not to speak of negroes, your planter's remark I have heard apply to the Spanish and Indian intermixtures in our provinces, but I know nothing about the matter, he listlessly added, and here they entered the cabin. End of chapter 8 Chapter 9 of Benito Sereno Business The lunch was a frugal one. Some of Captain Delano's fresh fish and pumpkins, biscuit and salt beef, the reserved bottle of cider, and the San Dominique's last bottle of canary. As they entered, Francesco, with two or three coloured aides, was hovering over the table giving the last adjustments. Upon perceiving their master, they withdrew, Francesco making a smiling conge, and the Spaniard, without condescending to notice it, fastidiously remarking to his companion that he relished not superfluous attendance. Without companions, host and guest sat down, like a childless married couple, at opposite ends of the table. Don Benito waving Captain Delano to his place, and... Weak as he was, insisting upon that gentleman being seated before himself. The negro placed a rug under Don Benito's feet and a cushion behind his back and then stood behind, not his master's chair, but Captain Delano's. At first, this a little surprised the latter, but it was soon evident that in taking his position, the black was still true to his master, since by facing him, he could the more readily anticipate his slightest want. This is an uncommonly intelligent fellow of yours, Don Benito, whispered Captain Delano across the table. You say true, senor. During the repast, the guest again reverted to parts of Don Benito's story, begging further particulars here and there. 
he inquired how it was that the scurvy and fever should have committed such wholesale havoc upon the white while destroying less than half of the blacks as if this question reproduced the whole scene of plague before the spaniard's eyes miserably reminding him of his solitude in the cabin where before he had had so many friends and officers round him his hand shook his face became hueless broken words escaped but directly the sane memory of the past seemed replaced by insane terrors of the present with starting eyes he stared before him at vacancy for nothing was to be seen but the hand of his servant pushing the canary over towards him at length a few sips served partially to restore him he made random reference to the different constitutions of races enabling one to offer more resistance to certain maladies than another the thought was new to his companion presently captain delano intending to say something to his host concerning the pecuniary part of the business he had undertaken for him especially since he was strictly accountable to his owners with reference to the new suit of sails and other things of that sort and naturally preferring to conduct such affairs in private was desirous that the servant should withdraw imagining that don benito for a few minutes could dispense with his attendance he however waited a while thinking that as the conversation proceeded don benito without being prompted would perceive the propriety of the step but it was otherwise at last catching his host's eye captain delano with a slight backward gesture of his thumb whispered don benito pardon me but there is an interference with the full expression of what i have to say to you upon this the spaniard changed countenance which was imputed to his resenting the hint as in some way a reflection upon his servant after a moment's pause he assured his guest that the blacks remaining with them would be of no disservice because since losing his offices he had made babo whose original office it now appeared had been captain of the slaves not only his constant attendant and companion but in all things his confidant after this nothing more could be said though indeed captain delano could hardly avoid some little tinge of irritation upon being left ungratified in so inconsiderable a wish by one too for whom he intended such solid services but it is only his querulousness thought he and so filling his glass he proceeded to business the price of the sales and other matters was fixed upon but while this was being done the american observed that though his original offer of assistance had been hailed with hectic animation yet now when it was reduced to a business transaction indifference and apathy were betrayed don benito in fact appeared to submit to hearing the details more out of regard to common propriety than from any impression that weighty benefit to himself and his voyage was involved soon his manner became still more reserved the effort was vain to seek to draw him into social talk gnawed by his splenetic mood he sat twitching his beard while to little purpose the hand of his servant mute as that on the wall slowly pushed over the canary lunch being over they sat down on the cushioned transom the servant placing a pillow behind his master the long continuance of the calm had now affected the atmosphere don benito sighed heavily as if for breath why not adjourn to the cuddy said captain delano there is more air there but the host sat silent and motionless meantime his servant knelt before him with a large fan of feathers and francesco coming in on tiptoes handed the negro a little cup of aromatic waters with which at intervals he chafed his master's brow smoothing the hair along the temples as a nurse does a child's he spoke no word he only rested his eye on his master's as if amid all don benito's distress a little to refresh his spirit by the silent sight of fidelity end of chapter nine chapter ten of benito sereno safe harbor presently the ship's bell sounded two o'clock and through the cabin windows a slight rippling of the sea was discerned, and from the desired direction. "'There!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'I told you so, Don Benito. Look!' 
he had risen to his feet, speaking in a very animated tone, with a view the more to rouse his companion. But though the crimson curtain of the stern window near him that moment fluttered against his pale cheek, Don Benito seemed to have even less welcome for the breeze than the calm. Poor fellow, thought Captain Delano, bitter experience has taught him that one ripple does not make a wind, any more than one swallow a summer. But he is mistaken for once. I will get his ship in for him and prove it. Briefly alluding to his weak condition, he urged his host to remain quietly where he was, since he, Captain Delano, would with pleasure take upon himself the responsibility of making the best use of the wind. Upon gaining the deck, Captain Delano started at the unexpected figure of Atufal, monumentally fixed at the threshold, like one of those sculptured porters of black marble guarding the porches of Egyptian tombs. But this time the start was, perhaps, purely physical. Atufal's presence, singularly attesting docility, even in sullenness, was contrasted with that of the hatchet polishers, who, in patience, evinced their industry, while both spectacles showed that lax as Don Benito's general authority might be, still, whenever he chose to exert it, no man so savage or colossal but must, more or less, bow. Snatching a trumpet which hung from the bulwarks, with a free step Captain Delano advanced to the forward edge of the poop, issuing his orders in his best Spanish. The few sailors and many negroes, all equally pleased, obediently set about heading the ship toward the harbor. While giving some directions about setting a lower stunsail, suddenly Captain Delano heard a voice faithfully repeating his orders. Turning, he saw Babo, now for the time acting under the pilot, his original part of captain of the slaves. This assistance proved valuable. Tattered sails and warped yards were soon brought into some trim, and no brace or halyard was pulled but to the blithe songs of the inspirited negroes. Good fellows, thought Captain Delano, a little training would make fine sailors of them. Why, see, the very women pull and sing, too. These must be some of those Ashanti negresses that make such capital soldiers, I've heard. But who's at the helm? I must have a good hand there. He went to sea. The San Dominic steered with a cumbrous tiller, with large horizontal pulleys attached. At each pulley end stood a subordinate black, and between them, at the tiller head, the responsible post, a Spanish seaman, whose countenance evinced his due share in the general hopefulness and confidence at the coming of the breeze. He proved the same man who had behaved with so shamefaced an air on the windlass. "'Ah, it is you, my man!' exclaimed Captain Delano. "'Well, no more sheep's eyes now. Look straight forward and keep the ship so. Good hand, I trust, and want to get into the harbor, don't you?' "'Si, senor,' assented the man with an inward chuckle, grasping the tiller head firmly. Upon this, unperceived by the American, the two blacks eyed the sailor askance. Finding all right at the helm, the pilot went forward to the forecastle to see how matters stood there. The ship now had way enough to breast the current. With the approach of evening, the breeze would be sure to freshen. Having done all that was needed for the present, Captain Delano, giving his last orders to the sailors, turned aft to report affairs to Don Benito in the cabin, perhaps additionally incited to rejoin him by the hope of snatching a moment's private chat while his servant was engaged upon deck. From opposite sides there were, beneath the poop, two approaches to the cabin, one further forward than the other, and consequently communicating with a longer passage. Marking the servant still above, Captain Delano, taking the nightest entrance, the one last named, and at whose porch Atufal still stood, 
hurried on his way till, arrived at the cabin threshold, he paused an instant, a little to recover from his eagerness. Then, with the words of his intended business upon his lips, he entered. As he advanced toward the Spaniard, on the transom, he heard another footstep keeping time with his. From the opposite door, a salver in hand, the servant was likewise advancing. Confound the faithful fellow, thought Captain Delano. What a vexatious coincidence. Possibly the vexation might have been something different, were it not for the buoyant confidence inspired by the breeze. But even as it was, he felt a slight twinge from a sudden involuntary association in his mind of Babo with Atufal. Don Benito, said he, I give you joy. The breeze will hold and will increase. By the way, your tall man and timepiece, Atufal, stands without. By your order, of course? Don Benito recoiled, as if at some bland satirical touch, delivered with such adroit garnish of apparent good breeding as to present no handle for retort. He is like one flayed alive, thought Captain Delano. Where may one touch him without causing a shrink? The servant moved before his master, adjusting a cushion, recalled to civility, the Spaniard stiffly replied, You are right. The slave appears where you saw him, according to my command, which is that if at the given hour I am below, he must take his stand and abide my coming. Ah, now, pardon me, but that is treating the poor fellow like an ex-king denied. Ah, Don Benito, smiling, for all the license you permit in some things, I fear lest at bottom you are a bitter hard master. Again Don Benito shrank, and this time, as the good sailor thought, from a genuine twinge of his conscience. Conversation now became constrained. In vain, Captain Delano called attention to the now perceptible motion of the keel gently cleaving the sea. With lackluster eye, Don Benito returned words few and reserved. By and by, the wind having steadily risen, and still blowing right into the harbor, bore the San Dominic swiftly on. Rounding a point of land, the sealer at distance came into open view. Meantime, Captain Delano had again repaired to the deck, remaining there some time. Having at last altered the ship's course, so as to give the reef a wide berth, he returned for a few moments below. I will cheer up my poor friend this time, thought he. Better and better, Don Benito, he cried as he blithely re-entered. There will soon be an end to your cares, at least for a while. For when, after a long, sad voyage, you know, the anchor drops into the heaven, all its vast weight seems lifted from the captain's heart. We are getting on famously, Don Benito. My ship is in sight. Look through the side light here. There she is, all a taunt, oh. The bachelor's delight, my good friend. Ah, how this wind braces one up. Come, you must take a cup of coffee with me this evening. My old steward will give you as fine a cup as ever any sultan tasted. What say you, Don Benito? Will you? At first, the Spaniard glanced feverishly up, casting a longing look toward the sealer, while with mute concern his servant gazed into his face. Suddenly the old ague of coldness returned, and dropping back to his cushions he was silent. You do not answer. Come, all day you have been my host. Would you have hospitality all on one side? I cannot go, was the response. What? It will not fatigue you. The ships will lie together as near as they can, without swinging foul. It will be little more than stepping from deck to deck which is but as from room to room. Come, come, you must not refuse me. I cannot go, decisively and repulsively repeated Don Benito. Renouncing all but the last appearance of courtesy, with a sort of cadaverous sullenness, and biting his thin nails to the quick, he glanced, almost glared, at his guest, as if impatient that a stranger's presence 
should interfere with the full indulgence of his morbid hour. Meantime, the sound of the parted waters came more and more gurglingly and merrily in at the windows, as reproaching him for his dark spleen, as telling him that, sulk as he might, and go mad with it, nature cared not a jot, since whose fault was it, pray? But the foul mood was now at its depth, as the fair wind at its height. There was something in the man so far beyond any mere unsociality or sourness previously evinced, that even the forbearing good nature of his guest could no longer endure it. Wholly at a loss to account for such demeanor, and deeming sickness with eccentricity, however extreme, no adequate excuse, well satisfied, too, that nothing in his own conduct could justify it, Captain Delano's pride began to be roused, himself became reserved, but all seemed one to the Spaniard. Quitting him, therefore, Captain Delano once more went to the deck. The ship was now within less than two miles of the sealer. The whaleboat was seen darting over the interval. To be brief, the two vessels, thanks to the pilot's skill, ere long in neighborly style lay anchored together. Before returning to his own vessel, Captain Delano had intended communicating to Don Benito the practical details of the proposed services to be rendered, but, as it was, unwilling anew to subject himself to rebuffs, he resolved, now that he had seen the San Dominic safely moored, immediately to quit her without further allusion to hospitality or business. Indefinitely postponing his ulterior plans, he would regulate his future actions according to future circumstances. His boat was ready to receive him, but his host still tarried below. Well, thought Captain Delano, if he has little breeding, the more need to show mine. He descended to the cabin to bid a ceremonious and, it may be, tacitly rebukeful adieu. But, to his great satisfaction, Don Benito, as if he began to feel the weight of that treatment with which his slighted guest had, not indecorously, retaliated upon him, now supported by his servant, rose to his feet, and, grasping Captain Delano's hand, stood tremulous, too much agitated, to speak. But the good augury hence drawn was suddenly dashed, by his resuming all his previous reserve, with augmented gloom, as, with half-averted eyes, he silently reseated himself on his cushions. With a corresponding return of his own chilled feelings, Captain Delano bowed and withdrew. He was hardly midway in the narrow corridor, dim as a tunnel, leading from the cabin to the stairs, when a sound, as of the tolling for execution in some jail yard, fell on his ears. It was the echo of the ship's flawed bell striking the hour, drearily reverberated in this subterranean vault. Instantly, by a fatality not to be withstood, his mind, responsive to the portent, swarmed with superstitious suspicions. He paused. In images far swifter than these sentences, the minutest detail of all his former distrusts swept through him. Hitherto, credulous good nature had been too ready to furnish excuses for reasonable fears. Why was the Spaniard, so superfluously punctilious at times, now heedless of common propriety in not accompanying to the side his departing guest? Did indisposition forbid? Indisposition had not forbidden more irksome exertion that day. His last equivocal demeanor recurred. He had risen to his feet, grasped his guest's hand, motioned toward his hat. Then, in an instant, all was eclipsed in sinister muteness and gloom. Did this imply one brief, repentant, relenting at the final moment from some iniquitous plot, followed by remorseless return to it? His last glance seemed to express a calamitous yet acquiescent farewell to Captain Delano forever. Why decline the invitation to visit the sealer that evening? Or was the Spaniard less hardened than the Jew, 
who refrained not from supping at the board of him whom the same night he meant to betray. What imported all those day-long enigmas and contradictions, except they were intended to mystify, preliminary to some stealthy blow? Atufal, the pretended rebel, but punctual shadow, that moment lurked by the threshold without. He seemed a sentry, and more. Who, by his own confession, had stationed him there? Was the negro now lying in wait? The Spaniard behind, his creature before, to rush from darkness to light was the involuntary choice. The next moment, with clenched jaw and hand, he passed Atufal and stood unarmed in the light. As he saw his trim ship lying peacefully at her anchor and almost within ordinary call, as he saw his household boat with familiar faces in it patiently rising and falling on the short waves by the San Dominic's side, and then, glancing about the decks where he stood, saw the oakum pickers still gravely plying their fingers, and heard the low, buzzing whistle and industrious hum of the hatchet polishers still bestirring themselves over their endless occupation. And more than all, as he saw the benign aspect of nature taking her innocent repose in the evening, the screened sun in the quiet camp of the west shining out like the mild light from Abraham's tent. As his charmed eye and ear took in all these, with the chained figure of the black, the clenched jaw and hand relaxed. Once again, he smiled at the phantoms which had mocked him and felt something like a tinge of remorse that, by indulging them even for a moment, he should, by implication, have betrayed an almost atheistic doubt of the ever-watchful providence above. End of chapter 10 Chapter 11 of Benito Sereno Into the Boat There was a few minutes' delay while, in obedience to his orders, the boat was being hooked along to the gangway. During this interval, a sort of saddened satisfaction stole over Captain Delano at thinking of the kindly offices he had that day discharged for a stranger. Ah, thought he, after good actions one's conscience is never ungrateful, however much so the benefited party may be. Presently, his foot in the first act of descent into the boat pressed the first round of the side ladder, his face presented inward upon the deck. In the same moment, he heard his name courteously sounded, and, to his pleased surprise, saw Don Benito advancing, an unwonted energy in his air, as if at the last moment intent upon making amends for his recent discourtesy. With instinctive good feeling, Captain Delano, revoking his foot, turned and reciprocally advanced. As he did so, the Spaniard's nervous eagerness increased, but his vital energy failed, so that, the better to support him, the servant, placing his master's hand on his naked shoulder and gently holding it there, formed himself into a sort of crutch. When the two captains met, the Spaniard again fervently took the hand of the American, at the same time casting an earnest glance into his eyes, but, as before, too much overcome to speak. I have done him wrong, self-reproachfully thought Captain Delano. His apparent coldness has deceived me. In no instance has he meant to offend. Meantime, as if fearful that the continuance of the scene might too much unstring his master, the servant seemed anxious to terminate it, and so, still presenting himself as a crutch, and walking between the two captains, he advanced with them toward the gangway, while still, as if full of kindly contrition, Don Benito would not let go the hand of Captain Delano, but retained it in his across the black's body. Soon they were standing by the side, looking over into the boat, whose crew turned up their curious eyes. Waiting a moment for the Spaniard to relinquish his hold, the now embarrassed Captain Delano lifted his foot to overstep the threshold of the open gangway. 
but still Don Benito would not let go his hand, and yet, with an agitated tone, he said, I can go no further. Here I must bid you adieu. Adieu, my dear, dear Don Amasa. Go, go, suddenly tearing his hand loose. Go, and God guard you better than me, my best friend. Not unaffected, Captain Delano would now have lingered, but catching the meekly admonitory eye of the servant, with a hasty farewell he descended into his boat, followed by the continual adieus of Don Benito, standing rooted in the gangway. Seating himself in the stern, Captain Delano, making a last salute, ordered the boat shoved off. The crew had their oars on end. The bowsmen pushed the boat a sufficient distance for the oars to be lengthwise dropped. The instant that was done, Don Benito sprang over the bulwarks, falling at the feet of Captain Delano, at the same time calling towards his ship, but in tones so frenzied that none in the boat could understand him. But, as if not equally obtuse, three Spanish sailors from three different and distant parts of the ship splashed into the sea, swimming after their captain, as if intent upon his rescue. The dismayed officer of the boat eagerly asked what this meant, to which Captain Delano, turning a disdainful smile upon the unaccountable Benito Sereno, answered that, for his part, he neither knew nor cared. But it seemed as if the Spaniard had taken it into his head to produce the impression among his people that the boat wanted to kidnap him or else give way for your lives, he wildly added, starting at a clattering hubbub in the ship, above which rang the tocsin of the hatchet polishers, and seizing Don Benito by the throat, he added, This plotting pirate means murder. Here, in apparent verification of the words, the servant, a dagger in his hand, was seen on the rail overhead, poised in the act of leaping, as if with desperate fidelity, to befriend his master to the last. While seemingly to aid the black, the three Spanish sailors were trying to clamber into the hampered bow. Meantime, the whole host of negroes, as if inflamed at the sight of their jeopardized captain, impended in one sooty avalanche over the bulwarks. All this, with what preceded, and what followed, occurred with such involutions of rapidity that past present and future, seemed one. Seeing the negro coming, Captain Delano had flung the Spaniard aside, almost in the very act of clutching him, and, by the unconscious recoil, shifting his place with arms thrown up, so promptly grappled the servant in his descent, that with dagger presented at Captain Delano's heart, the black seemed of purpose to have leaped there as to his mark. But the weapon was wrenched away, and the assailant dashed down into the bottom of the boat, which now, with disentangled oars, began to speed through the sea. At this juncture, the left hand of Captain Delano, on one side, again clutched the half-reclined Don Benito, heedless that he was in a speechless faint, while his right foot, on the other side, ground the prostrate negro, and his right arm pressed for added speed on the after-oar, his eye bent forward, encouraging his men to their utmost. But here the officer of the boat, who had at last succeeded in beating off the towing Spanish sailors, and was now with face turned aft, assisting the bowsman at his oar, suddenly called to Captain Delano to see what the black was about, while a Portuguese oarsman shouted to him to give heed to what the Spaniard was saying. Glancing down at his feet, Captain Delano saw the freed hand of the servant aiming with a second dagger, a small one, before concealed in his wool. With this he was snakishly writhing up from the boat's bottom at the heart of his master, his countenance lividly vindictive, expressing the centered purpose of his soul, while the Spaniard, half-choked, was vainly shrinking away with husky words incoherent to all but the Portuguese. That moment, across the long, benighted mind of Captain Delano, a flash of revelation swept, illuminating in unanticipated clearness Benito Sereno's whole mysterious demeanor, 
with every enigmatic event of the day, as well as the entire past voyage of the San Dominic. He smote Babo's hand down, but his own heart smote him harder. With infinite pity, he withdrew his hold from Don Benito, not Captain Delano, but Don Benito, the black in leaping into the boat, had intended to stab. Both the black's hands were held, as, glancing up toward the San Dominic, Captain Delano, now with the scales dropped from his eyes, saw the Negroes not in misrule, not in tumult, not as if frantically concerned for Don Benito, but with mask torn away, flourishing hatchets and knives in ferocious piratical revolt. Like delirious black dervishes, the six Ashantis danced on the poop. Prevented by their foes from springing into the water, the Spanish boys were hurrying up to the topmost spars, while such of the few Spanish sailors, not already in the sea, less alert, were descried, helplessly mixed in, on deck with the blacks. Meantime, Captain Delano hailed his own vessel, ordering the ports up and the guns run out. But by this time the cable of the San Dominic had been cut, and the fag end, in lashing out, whipped away the canvas shroud about the beak, suddenly revealing, as the bleached hull swung round toward the open ocean, death for the figurehead in a human skeleton. Chalky comment on the chalked words below. Follow your leader. At the sight, Don Benito, covering his face, wailed out, "'Tis he, Aranda, my murdered, unburied friend!' Upon reaching the sealer, calling for ropes, Captain Delano bound the negro, who made no resistance, and had him hoisted to the deck. He would then have assisted the now almost helpless Don Benito up the side, but Don Benito, wan as he was, refused to move, or be moved, until the negro should have been first put below, out of view." When, presently assured that it was done, he no more shrank from the ascent. The boat was immediately dispatched back to pick up the three swimming sailors. Meantime, the guns were in readiness, though, owing to the San Dominic having glided somewhat astern of the sealer, only the aftermost one could be brought to bear. With this, they fired six times, thinking to cripple the fugitive ship by bringing down her spars, but only a few inconsiderable ropes were shot away. Soon the ship was beyond the gun's range, steering broad out of the bay, the blacks thickly clustering round the bowsprit, one moment with taunting cries toward the whites, the next with upthrown gestures, hailing the now dusky expanse of ocean, cawing crows escaped from the hand of the fowler. End of chapter 11 Chapter 12 of Benito Sereno Pursuit The first impulse was to slip the cables and give chase, but upon second thought, to pursue with whaleboat and yawl seemed more promising. Upon inquiring of Don Benito what firearms they had on board the San Dominic, Captain Delano was answered that they had none that could be used because in the earlier stages of the mutiny, a cabin passenger, since dead, had secretly put out of order the locks of what few muskets there were. But with all his remaining strength, Don Benito entreated the Americans not to give chase, either with ship or boat, for the Negroes had already proved themselves such desperadoes that, in case of a present assault, nothing but a total massacre of the whites could be looked for. But regarding this warning as coming from one whose spirit had been crushed by misery, the American did not give up his design. The boats were got ready and armed. Captain Delano ordered twenty-five men into them. He was going himself when Don Benito grasped his arm. What? Have you saved my life, senor, and are you now going to throw away your own? The officers also, for reasons connected with their interests and those of the voyage, and a duty owing to the owners, strongly objected against their commander's going. 
weighing their remonstrances a moment, Captain Delano felt bound to remain, appointing his chief mate, an athletic and resolute man, who had been a privateersman, and, as his enemies whispered, a pirate, to head the party. The more to encourage the sailors, they were told that the Spanish captain considered his ship as good as lost, that she and her cargo, including some gold and silver, were worth upwards of ten thousand doubloons. Take her, and no small part should be theirs, the sailors replied with a shout. The fugitives had now almost gained an offing. It was nearly night, but the moon was rising. After hard, prolonged pulling, the boats came up on the ship's quarters, at a suitable distance, laying upon their oars to discharge their muskets. Having no bullets to return, the negroes sent their yells, but upon the second volley, Indian-like, they hurtled their hatchets. One took off a sailor's fingers. Another struck the whaleboat's bow, cutting off the rope there, and remaining stuck in the gunwale, like a woodman's axe. Snatching it, quivering from its lodgment, the mate hurled it back. The returned gauntlet now stuck in the ship's broken quarter-gallery, and so remained. The negroes giving too hot a reception, the whites kept a more respectful distance. Hovering now just out of reach of the hurtling hatchets, they, with a view to the close encounter which must soon come, sought to decoy the blacks into entirely disarming themselves of their most murderous weapons in a hand-to-hand -hand fight by foolishly flinging them as missiles short of the mark into the sea. But ere long perceiving the stratagem, the negroes desisted, though not before many of them had to replace their lost hatchets with handspikes, an exchange which, as counted upon, proved in the end favorable to the assailants. Meantime, with a strong wind, the ship still clove the water, the boats alternately falling behind and pulling up to discharge fresh volleys. The fire was mostly directed toward the stern, since there, chiefly, the negroes at present were clustering. But to kill or maim the negroes was not the object. To take them with the ship was the object. To do it, the ship must be boarded, which could not be done by boats while she was sailing so fast. A thought now struck the mate. Observing the Spanish boys still aloft, high as they could get, he called to them to descend to the yards and cut adrift the sails. It was done. About this time, owing to causes hereafter to be shown, two Spaniards in the dress of sailors and conspicuously showing themselves were killed, not by volleys but by deliberate marksman's shots, while, as it afterwards appeared, during one of the general discharges, Atufal, the black, and the Spaniard at the helm likewise were killed. What now, with the loss of the sails and loss of leaders, the ship became unmanageable to the negroes. With creaking masts, she came heavily round to the wind, the prow slowly swinging into view of the boats, its skeleton gleaming in the horizontal moonlight, and casting a gigantic ribbed shadow upon the water. One extended arm of the ghost seemed beckoning the whites to avenge it. "'Follow your leader!' cried the mate, and, one on each bow, the boats boarded. Sealing spears and cutlasses, crossed hatchets and handspikes. Huddled upon the longboat amidships, the negresses raised a wailing chant, whose chorus was the clash of the steel. For a time the attack wavered. The negroes, wedging themselves to beat it back, the half-repelled sailors, as yet unable to gain a footing, fighting as troopers in the saddle, one leg sideways flung over the bulwarks and one without, plying their cutlasses like carter's whips. But in vain. They were almost overborne, when, rallying themselves into a squad as one man, with a huzzah, they sprang inboard, where entangled they involuntarily separated again. For a few breaths' space, 
there was a vague, muffled inner sound as of submerged swordfish rushing hither and thither through shoals of black fish. Soon, in a reunited band and joined by the Spanish seamen, the whites came to the surface, irresistibly driving the negroes toward the stern. But a barricade of casks and sacks from side to side had been thrown up by the mainmast. Here the negroes faced about, and though scorning peace or truce, yet fain would have had a respite. But without pause, overleaping the barrier, the unflagging sailors again closed. Exhausted, the blacks now fought in despair. Their red tongues lolled wolf-like from their black mouths. But the pale sailor's teeth were set, not a word was spoken, and in five minutes more the ship was won. Nearly a score of the negroes were killed. Exclusive of those by the balls, many were mangled. Their wounds, mostly inflicted by the long-edged sealing spears, resembling those shaven ones of the English at Preston Pans, made by the polled scythes of the Highlanders. On the other side, none were killed, though several were wounded, some severely, including the mate. The surviving Negroes were temporarily secured, and the ship, towed back into the harbor at midnight, once more lay anchored. End of Chapter 12 Chapter 13 A Deposition Omitting the incidents and arrangements ensuing, suffice it that, after two days spent in refitting, the two ships sailed in company for Concepcion in Chile, and thence for Lima in Peru, where, before the vice-regal courts, the whole affair from the beginning underwent investigation. Though, midway on the passage, the ill-fated Spaniard relaxed from constraint, showed some signs of regaining health with free will. Yet, agreeably to his own foreboding, shortly before arriving at Lima, he relapsed, finally becoming so reduced as to be carried ashore in arms. Hearing of his story and plight, one of the many religious institutions of the City of Kings opened an hospitable refuge to him, where both physician and priest were his nurses, and a member of the order volunteered to be his one special guardian and consoler by night and by day. The following extracts, translated from one of the official Spanish documents, will, it is hoped, shed light on the preceding narrative, as well as, in the first place, reveal the true port of departure and true history of the San Dominique's voyage down to the time of her touching at the island of Santa Maria. But ere the extracts come, it may be well to preface them with a remark. The document selected, from among many others, for partial translation, contains the deposition of Benito Sereno, the first taken in the case. Some disclosures therein were, at the time, held dubious for both learned and natural reasons. The tribunal inclined to the opinion that the deponent, not undisturbed in his mind by recent events, raved of some things which could never have happened. But subsequent depositions of the surviving sailors, bearing out the revelations of their captain in several of the strangest particulars, gave credence to the rest, so that the tribunal, in its final decision, rested its capital sentences upon statements which, had they lacked confirmation, it would have deemed it but duty to reject. I, Don José de Abos and Padilla, His Majesty's Notary for the Royal Revenue, and Register of this province, and Notary Public of the Holy Crusade of this bishopric, etc., do certify and declare, as much as is requisite in law, that in the criminal case commenced the twenty-fourth of the month of September, in the year seventeen hundred and ninety-nine, against the Senegal Negroes of the ship San Dominique, the following declaration before me was made. Declaration of the First Witness, Don Benito Sereno. The same day and month and year, His Honor, Dr. Juan Martinez de Dosas, Counselor of the Royal Audience of this Kingdom, and learned in the law of this intendancy, ordered the captain of the ship San Dominique, Don Benito Sereno, to appear, which he did in his litter, 
attended by the monk in Feles, of whom he received, before Don José de Abos and Padilla, notary public of the Holy Crusade, the oath, which he took by God, our Lord, and a sign of the cross, under which he promised to tell the truth of whatever he should know and should be asked, and being interrogated agreeably to the tenor of the act commencing the process, he said that on the 20th of May last he set sail with his ship from the port of Valparaiso, bound to that of Cajao, loaded with the produce of the country, and one hundred and sixty blacks of both sexes, mostly belonging to Don Alejandro Aranda, gentleman of the city of Mendoza, that the crew of the ship consisted of thirty-six men, beside the persons who went as passengers, that the negroes were in part as follows. Here in the original follows a list of some fifty names, descriptions, and ages, compiled from certain recovered documents of Aranda's, and also from recollections of the deponent, from which portions only are extracted one from about eighteen to nineteen years named jose and this was the man that waited upon his master don alejandro and who speaks well the spanish having served him four or five years a mulatto named francesco the cabin steward of a good person and voice having sung in the valparaiso churches native of the province of buenos aires aged about thirty-five years a smart negro named dago who had been for many years a grave-digger among the Spaniards, aged forty-six years. Four old negroes, born in Africa, from sixty to seventy, but sound cockers by trade, whose names are as follows. The first was named Muri, and he was killed, as was also his son named Diamelo. The second, Nakta, the third, Jola, likewise killed. The fourth, Gofan, and six full-grown negroes, aged from thirty to forty-five, all raw and born among the Ashantis, Martiniki, Yan, Lekbe, Mapenda, Yambayo, Akim, four of whom were killed, a powerful negro named Atufal, who, being supposed to have been a chief in Africa, his owners set great store by him, and a small negro of Senegal, but some years among the Spaniards, aged about thirty, which Negro's name was Babo. That he does not remember the names of the others, but that still expecting the residue of Don Alejandro's papers will be found, will then take due account of them all, and remit to the court, and thirty-nine women and children of all ages. After the catalogue, the deposition goes on as follows. That all the Negroes slept upon deck, as is customary, in this navigation, and none wore fetters, because the owner, his friend Aranda, told him that they were all tractable. That on the seventh day, after leaving port, at three o'clock in the morning, all the Spaniards being asleep, except the two officers on the watch, who were the boatswain Juan Robles, and the carpenter, Juan Bautista Gallete, and the helmsman and his boy, the negroes revolted suddenly, wounded dangerously the boatswain and the carpenter, and successively killed eighteen men of those who were sleeping upon deck, some with handspikes and hatchets, and others by throwing them alive overboard, after tying them. That of the Spaniards upon deck, they left about seven, as he thinks, alive and tied, to maneuver the ship, and three or four more who hid themselves remained also alive. Although in the act of revolt, the negroes made themselves masters of the hatchway, six or seven wounded went through it to the cockpit without any hindrance on their part that in the act of revolt the mate and another person whose name he does not recollect attempted to come up through the hatchway but having been wounded at the onset they were obliged to return to the cabin that the deponent resolved at break of day to come up the companionway where the negro babo was being the ringleader and Atufal, who assisted him, and having spoken to them, exhorted them to cease committing such atrocities, asking them, at the same time, what they wanted and intended to do, offering himself to obey their commands, that, notwithstanding this, they threw in his presence three men alive and tied overboard, that they told the deponent to come up, and that they would not kill him, 
which having done, the negro Babo asked him whether there were in those seas any negro countries where they might be carried, and he answered them, no, that the negro Babo afterwards told him to carry them to Senegal, or to the neighboring islands of St. Nicholas, and he answered that this was impossible, on account of the great distance, the necessity involved of rounding Cape Horn, the bad condition of the vessel, the want of provisions, sails, and water, but that the negro Babo replied to him he must carry them in any way, that they would do and conform themselves to everything the deponent should require, as to eating and drinking, that after a long conference, being absolutely compelled to please them, for they threatened him to kill all the whites if they were not, at all events, carried to Senegal, he told them that what was most wanting for the voyage was water, that they would go near the coast to take it, and hence they would proceed on their course, that the negro Babo agreed to it, and the deponent steered toward the intermediate ports, hoping to meet some Spanish or foreign vessel that would save them, that within ten or eleven days they saw the land, and continued their course by it in the vicinity of Nazca, that the deponent observed that the negroes were now restless and mutinous, because he did not affect the taking in of water, the negro Babo having required, with threats, that it should be done, without fail, the following day. He told him he saw plainly that the coast was steep, and the rivers designated in the maps were not to be found, with other reasons suitable to the circumstances, that the best way would be to go to the island of Santa Maria, where they might water and victual easily, it being a desert island, as the foreigners did that the deponent did not go to Pisco, that was near, nor make any other port of the coast, because the negro Babo had intimated to him several times that he would kill all the whites the very moment he should perceive any city, town, or settlement of any kind on the shores to which they should be carried, that having determined to go to the island of Santa Maria, as the deponent had planned, for the purpose of trying, whether in the passage or in the island itself, they could find any vessel that should favor them, or whether he could escape from it in a boat to the neighboring coast of Arruco. To adopt the necessary means, he immediately changed his course, steering for the island. That the negroes Babo and Atufal held daily conferences, in which they discussed what was necessary for their design of returning to Senegal, whether they were to kill all the Spaniards, and particularly the deponent that eight days after parting from the coast of Nazca, the deponent being on the watch a little after daybreak, and soon after the negroes had their meeting, the negro Babo came to the place where the deponent was, and told him that he had determined to kill his master, Don Alejandro Aranda, both because he and his companions could not otherwise be sure of their liberty, and that, to keep the seamen in subjection, he wanted to prepare a warning, of what road they should be made to take, did they or any of them oppose him, and that, by means of the death of Don Alejandro, that warning would best be given, but that what this last meant the deponent did not at the time comprehend, nor could not, further than that the death of Don Alejandro was intended. And moreover, the negro Babo proposed to the deponent to call the mate Ranads, who was sleeping in the cabin, before the thing was done, for fear, as the deponent understood it, that the mate, who was a good navigator, should be killed with Don Alejandro, and the rest. That the deponent, who was the friend from youth of Don Alejandro, prayed and conjured, but all was useless, for the negro Babo answered him that the thing could not be prevented and that all the Spaniards risked their death if they should attempt to frustrate his will in this matter, or in any other. That, in this conflict, the deponent called the mate Ranads, who was forced to go apart, and immediately the negro Babo commanded the Ashanti Martinique and the Ashanti Lecbe to go and commit the murder, that those two went down with the hatchets to the birth of Don Alejandro, that, yet half alive and mangled, they dragged him on deck, that they were going to throw him overboard in that state, but the negro Babo stopped them, bidding the murder be completed on the deck before him, which was done, 
when, by his orders, the body was carried below, forward, that nothing more was seen of it by the deponent for three days, that Don Alonso Sidonia, an old man, long resident of Valparaiso, and lately appointed to a civil office in Peru, whither he had taken passage, was at the time sleeping in the berth opposite Don Alejandro's, that, awakening at his cries, surprised by them, and at the sight of the negroes with their bloody hatchets in their hands, he threw himself into the sea, through a window which was near him, and was drowned, without it being in the power of the deponent to assist or take him up. That, a short time after killing Aranda, they brought upon deck his German cousin of middle age, Don Francisco Massa, of Mendoza, and the young Don Joaquin, Marquez de Aramboalasa, then lately from Spain, with his Spanish servant Ponce, and the three young clerks of Aranda, José Mozairi, Lorenzo Vargas, and Hermenegildo Gandix, all of Cadiz, that Don Joaquin and Hermenegildo Gandix, the negro babo, for purposes hereafter to appear, preserved alive, but Don Francisco Massa, José Mozairi, and Lorenzo Vargas, with Ponce, the servant, besides the boson, Juan Robles, the boson's mates, Manuel Vizcaya and Rodrigo Urza, and four of the sailors, the negro babo ordered to be thrown alive into the sea, although they made no resistance, nor begged for anything else but mercy. That the boson, Juan Robles, who knew how to swim, kept the longest above water, making acts of contrition, and in the last words he uttered, charged this deponent to cause mass to be said for his soul to Our Lady of Succor. That during the three days which followed, the deponent, uncertain what fate had befallen the remains of Don Alejandro, frequently asked the negro babo where they were, and, if still on board, whether they were to be preserved for interment ashore, entreating him so to order it that the negro babo answered nothing till the fourth day, when at sunrise the deponent coming on deck, the negro babo showed him a skeleton, which had substituted for the ship's proper figurehead, the image of Christopher Colon, the discoverer of the new world, that the negro babo asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether, from its whiteness, he should not think it a white's, that, upon his covering his face, the negro babo, coming close, said words to this effect, quote, Keep faith with the blacks from here to Senegal, or you shall in spirit, as now in body, follow your leader, End quote. pointing to the prow. That the same morning the negro babo took by succession each Spaniard forward, and asked him whose skeleton that was, and whether, from its whiteness, he should not think it a white's. That each Spaniard covered his face, that then to each the negro babo repeated the words in the first place said to the deponent, that they, the Spaniards, being then assembled aft, the negro babo harangued them, saying that he had now done all, that the deponent, as navigator for the negroes, might pursue his course, warning him and all of them that they should, soul and body, go the way of Don Alejandro, if he saw them, the Spaniards, speak or plot anything against them, the negroes, a threat which was repeated every day. That, before the events last mentioned, they had tied the cook to throw him overboard, for it is not known what thing they heard him speak, but finally the negro babo spared his life at the request of the deponent, that a few days after, the deponent, endeavoring not to omit any means to preserve the lives of the remaining whites, spoke to the negroes peace and tranquillity, and agreed to draw up a paper, signed by the deponent and the sailors who could write, as also by the negro babo, for himself and all the blacks in which the deponent obliged himself to carry them to Senegal, and they not to kill any more, and he formally to make over to them the ship, with a cargo, with which they were for that time satisfied and quieted. But the next day, the more surely to guard against the sailors' escape, the negro babo commanded all the boats to be destroyed but the long-boat, which was unseaworthy, and another, a cutter in good condition, which, 
knowing it would yet be wanted for lowering the water casks he had it lowered down into the hold various particulars of the prolonged and perplexed navigation ensuing here follow with incidents of a calamitous calm from which portion one passage is extracted to wit that on the fifth day of the calm all on board suffering much from the heat and want of water and five having died in fits and mad the negroes became irritable and for a chance gesture which they deemed suspicious though it was harmless made by the mate ranids to the deponent in the act of handing a quadrant they killed him but that for this they afterwards were sorry the mate being the only remaining navigator on board except the deponent that omitting other events which daily happened and which can only serve uselessly to recall past misfortunes and conflicts after seventy-three days navigation reckoned from the time they sailed from nazca during which they navigated under a scanty allowance of water and were afflicted with the calms before mentioned they at last arrived at the island of santa maria on the seventeenth of the month of august at about six o'clock in the afternoon at which hour they cast anchor very near the american ship bachelor's delight which lay in the same bay commanded by the generous captain amasa delano but at six o'clock in the morning they had already descried the port and the negroes became uneasy as soon as at a distance they saw the ship not having expected to see one there that the negro babo pacified them assuring them that no fear need be had that straight away he ordered the figure on the bow to be covered with canvas as for repairs and had the decks a little set in order that for a time the negro babo and the negro atufal conferred that the negro atufal was for sailing away but the negro babo would not and by himself cast about what to do that at last he came to the deponent proposing to him to say and do all that the deponent declares to have said and done to the american captain that the negro babo warned him that if he varied in the least or uttered any word or gave any look that should give the least intimation of the past events or present state he would instantly kill him with all his companions showing a dagger which he carried hid saying something which as he understood it meant that the dagger would be alert as his eye that the negro babo then announced the plan to all his companions which pleased them that he then the better to disguise the truth devised many expedients in some of them uniting deceit and defence that of this sort was the device of the six ashantees before named who were his bravos that them he stationed on the break of the poop as if to clean certain hatchets in cases which were part of the cargo but in reality to use them and distribute them at need and at a given word he told them that among other devices was the device of presenting a tufal his right-hand man as chained though in a moment the chains could be dropped that in every particular he informed the deponent what part he was expected to enact in every device and what story he was to tell on every occasion always threatening him with instant death if he varied in the least that conscious that many of the negroes would be turbulent the negro babo appointed the four aged negroes who were cockers to keep what domestic order they could on the decks that again and again he harangued the spaniards and his companions informing them of his intent and of his devices and of the invented story that this deponent was to tell charging them lest any of them varied from that story that these arrangements were made and matured during the interval of two or three hours between their first sighting of the ship and the arrival on board of captain amasa delano that this happened at about half past seven in the morning captain amasa delano coming in his boat and all gladly receiving him that the deponent as well as he could force himself acting then the part of principal owner and a free captain of the ship told captain amasa delano when called upon that he came from buenos aires bound to lima with three hundred negroes that off cape horn and in a subsequent fever many negroes had died 
that also by similar casualties all the sea officers and the greatest part of the crew had died and so the deposition goes on circumstantially recounting the fictitious story dictated to the deponent by babo and through the deponent imposed upon captain delano and also recounting the friendly offers of captain delano with other things but all of which were omitted after the fictitious strange story etc the deposition proceeds that the generous captain amasa delano remained on board all the day till he left the ship anchored at six o'clock in the evening deponent speaking to him always of his pretended misfortunes under the forementioned principles without having had it in his power to tell a single word or give him the least hint that he might know the truth and state of things because the negro babo performing the office of an officious servant with all the appearance of submission of the humble slave did not leave the deponent one moment that this was in order to observe the deponent's actions and words for the negro babo understands well the spanish and besides there were thereabouts some others who were constantly on the watch and likewise understood the spanish that upon one occasion while deponent was standing on the deck conversing with amasa delano by a secret sign the negro babo drew him the deponent aside the act appearing as if originating with the deponent that then he being drawn aside the negro babo proposed to him to gain from amasa delano full particulars about his ship and crew and arms that the deponent asked for what that the negro babo answered he might conceive that grieved at the prospect of what might overtake the generous captain amasa delano the deponent at first refused to ask the desired questions and used every argument to induce the negro babo to give up this new design that the negro babo showed the point of his dagger that after the information had been obtained the negro babo again drew him aside telling him that very night he the deponent would be captain of two ships instead of one for that great part of the american ship's crew being to be absent fishing the six ashantees without any one else would easily take it that at this time he said other things to the same purpose that no entreaties availed that before amasa delano's coming on board no hint had been given touching the capture of the american ship that to prevent this project the deponent was powerless that in some things his memory is confused he cannot distinctly recall every event that as soon as they had cast anchor at six of the clock in the evening as has before been stated the american captain took leave to return to his vessel that upon a sudden impulse which the deponent believes to have come from god and his angels he after the farewell had been said followed the generous captain amasa delano as far as the gunwale where he stayed under the pretense of taking leave until amasa delano should have been seated in his boat that on shoving off the deponent sprang from the gunwale into the boat and fell into it he knows not how god guarding him that here in the original follows the account of what further happened at the escape and how the san dominique was retaken and of the passage to the coast including in the recital many expressions of eternal gratitude to the generous captain amasa delano the deposition then proceeds with recapitulatory remarks and a partial remuneration of the negroes making record of their individual part in the past events with a view to furnishing according to command of the court the data whereon to found the criminal sentences to be pronounced from this portion is the following that he believes that all the negroes though not in the first place knowing to the design of revolt when it was accomplished approved it that the negro jose eighteen years old and in the personal service of don alejandro was the one who communicated the information to the negro babo about the state of things in the cabin before the revolt that this is known because in the preceding midnight he used to come from his berth which was under his masters in the cabin to the deck where the ringleader and his associates were and had secret conversations with the negro babo in which he was several times seen by the mate 
that one night the mate drove him away twice that this same negro jose was the one who without being commanded to do so by the negro babo as lecbe and martinqui were stabbed his master don alejandro after he had been dragged half lifeless to the deck that the mulatto steward francesco was of the first band of revolters that he was in all things the creature and tool of the negro babo that to make his court he just before a repast in the cabin proposed to the negro babo poisoning a dish for the generous captain amasa delano this is known and believed because the negroes have said it but that the negro babo having another design forbade francesco that the ashanti lecbe was one of the worst of them for that on the day the ship was retaken he assisted in the defence of her with a hatchet in each hand with one of which he wounded in the breast the chief mate of amasa delano in the first act of boarding this all knew that in sight of the deponent lecbe struck with a hatchet don francisco massa when by the negro babo's orders he was carrying him to throw him overboard alive beside participating in the murder before mentioned of don alejandro aranda and others of the cabin passengers that owing to the fury with which the ashantees fought in the engagement with the boats but this elecbe and john survived that john was bad as lecbe that john was the man who by babo's command willingly prepared the skeleton of don alejandro in a way the negroes afterwards told the deponent but which he so long as reason is left him can never divulge that jean and lecbe were the two who in a calm by night riveted the skeleton to the bow this also the negroes told him that the negro babo was he who traced the inscription below it that the negro babo was the plotter from first to last he ordered every murder and was the helm and keel of the revolt that atufal was his lieutenant in all but atufal with his own hand committed no murder nor did the negro babo that atufal was shot being killed in the fight with the boats ere boarding that the negresses of age were knowing to the revolt and testified themselves satisfied at the death of their master don alejandro that had the negroes not restrained them they would have tortured to death instead of simply killing the spaniards slain by command of the negro babo that the negresses used their utmost influence to have the deponent made away with that in the various acts of murder they sang songs and danced not gaily but solemnly and before the engagement with the boats as well as during the action they sang melancholy songs to the negroes and that this melancholy tone was more inflaming than a different one would have been and was so intended that all this is believed because the negroes have said it that of the thirty-six men of the crew exclusive of the passengers all of whom are now dead which the deponent had knowledge of six only remained alive with four cabin boys and ship boys not included with the crew that the negroes broke an arm of one of the cabin boys and gave him strokes with hatchets then follow various random disclosures referring to various periods of time the following are extracted that during the presence of captain amasa delano on board some attempts were made by the sailors and one by Hermenegildo gandix to convey hints to him of the true state of affairs but that these attempts were ineffectual owing to fear of incurring death and furthermore owing to the devices which offered contradictions to the true state of affairs as well as owing to the generosity and piety of amasa delano incapable of sounding such wickedness that luis galgo a sailor about sixty years of age and formerly of the king's navy was one of those who sought to convey tokens to captain amasa delano but his intent though undiscovered being suspected he was on a pretence made to retire out of sight and at last into the hold and there was made away with this the negroes have since said that one of the ship boys feeling from captain amaso delano's presence some hopes of release and not having enough prudence 
dropped some chance word respecting his expectations, which, being overheard and understood by a slave boy with whom he was eating at the time, the latter struck him on the head with a knife, inflicting a bad wound, but of which the boy is now healing. That likewise, not long before the ship was brought to anchor, one of the seamen, steering at the time, endangered himself by letting the blacks remark a certain unconscious hopeful expression in his countenance, arising from some cause similar to the above. But this sailor, by his heedful after-conduct, escaped. That these statements are made to show the court that from the beginning to the end of the revolt, it was impossible for the deponent and his men to act otherwise than they did that the third clerk, Hermenegildo Gandix, who before had been forced to live among the seamen, wearing a seaman's habit, and in all respects appearing to be one for the time, he, Gandix, was killed by a musket ball fired through a mistake from the American boats before boarding. Having in his fright ran up the mizzen rigging, calling to the boats, Don't board, lest upon their boarding the negroes should kill him that this inducing the Americans to believe he some way favored the cause of the Negroes, they fired two balls at him, so that he fell wounded from the rigging, and was drowned in the sea. That the young Don Joaquin, Marques de Arambolasa, like Hermenegildo Gandix, the third clerk, was degraded to the office and appearance of a common seaman. That upon one occasion, when Don Joaquin shrank, the Negro Babo commanded the Ashanti Lecbe, to take tar and heat it, and pour it upon Don Joaquin's hands. That Don Joaquin was killed owing to another mistake of the Americans, but one impossible to be avoided, as upon the approach of the boats, Don Joaquin, with a hatchet tied edge out and upright to his hand, was made by the negroes to appear on the bulwarks, whereupon, seen with arms in his hands and in a questionable attitude, he was shot for a renegade seaman. That on the person of Don Joaquin was found secreted a jewel, which by papers that were discovered proved to have been meant for the shrine of Our Lady of Mercy in Lima. A votive offering beforehand prepared and guarded to attest his gratitude when he should have landed in Peru, his last destination, for the safe conclusion of his entire voyage from Spain. That the jewel with the other effects of the late Don Joaquin, is in the custody of the brethren of the Hospital de Sacerdotes, awaiting the decision of the Honorable Court. That, owing to the condition of the deponent, as well as the haste in which the boats departed for the attack, the Americans were not forewarned that there were, among the apparent crew, a passenger and one of the clerks disguised by the Negro Babo that, besides the negroes killed in the action, some were killed after the capture and re-anchoring at night, when shackled to the ring-bolts on the deck, that these deaths were committed by the sailors, ere they could be prevented, that so soon as informed of it, Captain Amasa Delano used all his authority, and, in particular, with his own hand, struck down Martinez Gola, who, having found a razor in the pocket of an old jacket of his, which one of the shackled negroes had on, was aiming it at the negro's throat. That the noble Captain Amasa de Lano also wrenched from the hand of Bartholomew Barlo a dagger secreted at the time of the massacre of the whites, with which he was in the act of stabbing a shackled negro, who the same day, with another negro, had thrown him down and jumped upon him that for all the events befalling through so long a time, during which the ship was in the hands of the negro babo, he cannot here give account, but that what he has said is the most substantial of what occurs to him at present, and is the truth under the oath which he has taken, which declaration he affirmed and ratified, after hearing it read to him. He said that he is twenty-nine years of age, and broken in body and mind, that when finally dismissed by the court, he shall not return home to Chile, but betake himself to the monastery of the Mount Agonia without, and signed with his honor, and crossed himself, and for the time departed as he came in his litter, with a monk in Feles, to the Hospital de Sacerdotes. End of chapter 13
Chapter 14 of Benito Sereno Conclusion If the deposition of Benito Sereno has served as the key to fit into the lock of the complications which preceded it, then, as a vault whose door has been flung back, the San Dominic's hull lies open today. Hitherto the nature of this narrative, besides rendering the intricacies in the beginning unavoidable, has more or less required that many things, instead of being set down in the order of occurrence, should be retrospectively or irregularly given. This last is the case with the following passages, which will conclude the account. During the long, mild voyage to Lima, there was, as before hinted, a period during which Don Benito a little recovered his health, or, at least in some degree, his tranquillity. Ere the decided relapse which came, the two captains had many cordial conversations, their fraternal unreserve in singular contrast with former withdrawments. Again and again it was repeated how hard it had been to enact the part forced on the Spaniard by Babo. Ah, my dear Dona Massa, Don Benito once said, at those very times when you thought me so morose and ungrateful, nay, when, as you now admit, you half thought me plotting your murder, at those very times my heart was frozen. I could not look at you, thinking of what, both on board this ship and your own, hung from other hands over my kind benefactor. And, as God lives, Don Amasa, I know not whether desire for my own safety alone could have nerved me to that leap into your boat had it not been for the thought that, did you, unenlightened, return to your ship, you, my best friend, with all who might be with you, stolen upon that night in your hammocks, would never in this world have wakened again. Do but think how you walked this deck, how you sat in this cabin, every inch of ground mined into honeycombs under you. Had I dropped the least hint, made the least advance toward an understanding between us, death, explosive death, yours and mine, would have ended the scene. True, true, cried Captain Delano, starting. You saved my life, Don Benito, more than I yours. Saved it, too, against my knowledge and will. Nay, my friend, rejoined the Spaniard, courteous even to the point of religion, God charmed your life, but you saved mine. To think of some things you did, those smilings and chattings, rash pointings and gesturings. For less than these, they slew my mate, Raynids. But you had the Prince of Heaven's safe conduct through all ambuscades. Yes, all is owing to Providence, I know. But the temper of my mind that morning was more than commonly pleasant, while the sight of so much suffering more apparent than real, added to my good nature, compassion, and charity, happily interweaving the three. Had it been otherwise, doubtless, as you hint, some of my interferences with the blacks might have ended unhappily enough. Besides that, those feelings I spoke of enabled me to get the better of momentary distrust at times when acuteness might have cost me my life without saving another's. Only at the end, did my suspicions get the better of me, and you know how wide of the mark they then proved. Wide indeed, said Don Benito sadly. You were with me all day, stood with me, sat with me, talked with me, looked at me, ate with me, drank with me, and yet your last act was to clutch for a villain, not only an innocent man, but the most pitiable of all men. To such degree may malign machinations and deceptions impose. So far may even the best men err in judging the conduct of one with the recesses of whose condition he is not acquainted. But you were forced to it, and you were in time undeceived. Would that in both respects it was so ever, and with all men. I think I understand you. You generalized on Benito and mournfully enough. But the past is past. Why moralize upon it? Forget it. See, yon bright sun has forgotten it all, and the blue sea and the blue sky. These have turned over new leaves. 
because they have no memory, he dejectedly replied, because they are not human. But these mild trades that now fan your cheek, Don Benito, do they not come with a human-like healing to you? Warm friends, steadfast friends, are the trades. With their steadfastness they but waft me to my tomb, senor, was the foreboding response. You are saved, Don Benito, cried Captain Delano, more and more astonished and pained. You are saved. What has cast such a shadow upon you? The Negro. There was silence, while the moody man sat slowly and unconsciously gathering his mantle about him as if it were a pall. There was no more conversation that day. But if the Spaniard's melancholy sometimes ended in muteness upon topics like the above, there were others upon which he never spoke at all, on which, indeed, all his old reserves were piled. Pass over the worst, and only to elucidate, let an item or two of these be cited. The dress so precise and costly, worn by him on the day whose events have been narrated, had not willingly been put on, and that silver-mounted sword, apparent symbol of despotic command, was not indeed a sword, but the ghost of one. The scabbard, artificially stiffened, was empty. As for the black, whose brain, not body, had schemed and led the revolt with the plot, his slight frame inadequate to that which it held, had at once yielded to the superior muscular strength of his captor in the boat. Seeing all was over, he uttered no sound and could not be forced to. His aspect seemed to say, Since I cannot do deeds, I will not speak words. Put in irons in the hold, with the rest, he was carried to Lima, during the passage, Don Benito did not visit him, nor then, nor at any time after, would he look at him. Before the tribunal, he refused. When pressed by the judges, he fainted. On the testimony of the sailors alone rested the legal identity of Babo. And yet the Spaniard would, upon occasion, verbally refer to the Negro, as has been shown. But look on him he would not, or could not. Some months after, dragged to the gibbet at the tail of a mule, the black met his voiceless end. The body was burned to ashes, but for many days the head, that hive of subtlety, fixed on a pole in the plaza, met unabashed the gaze of the whites, and across the plaza looked toward St. Bartholomew's church, in whose vaults slept then, as now, the recovered bones of Aranda, and across the Rimac Bridge looked toward the monastery on Mount Agonia without, where, three months after being dismissed by the court, Benito Sereno, born on the bier, did indeed follow his leader. The End End of Chapter 14 Recording by James K. White, Chula Vista End of Benito Sereno by Herman Melville